Thank you. Okay, so um, like everybody here, I've known Mahalas for a very long time, actually more than 40 years in my case, and I just have nothing but praise for him as a scientist and as a human being. Unlike a lot of the other people here, I will not be able to present work that I did with Mahalas. <laughs> I'm I never actually worked with Mahalas, unfortunately. I wish I had. Um, I'm going to be presenting something that involves cryptography, which is actually the only part of computer science that Mahalas has not made a huge contribution to. So sorry about that, but that's sort of what's on my mind these days. Okay. So um, this is joint work with my, oh, so I am, in addition to being the Grace Murray Hopper Professor of Computer Science at Yale, I'm also an Amazon scholar. I work in the AWS crypto, cryptography group. And this is joint work with my colleagues, Eric Crockett, who is also in the cryptography group and who made some of these slides. He's more of a PowerPoint wizard than I am. And Gang Wang, who is trained as a computer scientist, but he works in Amazon ads. He works on ad tech. So anything I know about ads, I learned from Gang Wang. It's not much, but some of it's going to come up in this uh, talk. OK, so I'm going to talk about this work and maybe some open questions and some ongoing related work. And then I'm going to end the talk with some personal reflections about cryptographic computing. And this little story that I'm going to tell at the end actually started like very, very shortly after I met Mahalas. It started in fall of 82, so it's a long story. Okay, but I'll shorten it. All right, so I'm going to talk about something that is done billions of times, tens of billions of times on the internet every day, ad selection. Okay, so it's an interaction among three parties. The first is the advertiser. Now, an advertiser learns various things about his customers, in part by directly interacting with them, but maybe other ways as well. And he groups the customers into what we call segments. I'll explain what they are. Next, next slide. So this makes it look like the advertiser is a clothing store. It could be anything that advertises. If you think you might forget who's the advertiser, who's the publisher, whatever, just think advertiser is Nike. That's a good exemplar of an advertiser. OK, another party is the publisher. Publisher runs a website on which uh, users um, are shown ads. And if a user comes to this publisher's website and happens to be a customer of, an ad of this advertiser, then it would be good for all concerned if the information that the advertiser has about the segment membership, the, the, the segments in which this user belongs, is taken into account when selecting an ad. And the role of the ad tech company, that's the third party, is to facilitate the complex process of matching advertisers to publishers, that's ad auctions, and then once we know who's going who's gonna to serve an ad in this slot, selecting an appropriate ad. Okay, I am not going to talk at all in this talk about ad auctions, only about selecting appropriate ads. So by the time this work comes into the picture, a particular advertiser has won the auction for that slot. Okay, now what are segments? Like a lot of stuff, actually all stuff, I think, in advertising, there is no precise, you know, rigorous definition of segments. They're basically sets of customers or more generally users, because a user could come to the publisher's website who is not a customer of that advertiser. So sets of users who are defined by shared characteristics that are relevant in a particular business context. So one segment might be men who are interested in high-end running shoes. Nike would be interested in that segment. Another segment, some other advertiser might be high net worth couples who summer in the Berkshires. That's actually a uh, redundant description because everybody who uses the word summer as a verb is high net worth. Anyway, so um, the International Advertising Bureau apparently tried to standardize the taxonomy of segments. It was not very widely adopted was adopted in some verticals. All we care about is that the advertiser and the ad tech company have a common understanding of what the segments are. All right, so this problem, 
first of all, more in one way or another is being solved every day. So why am I talking about it? We'll get to that soon. But just to think it through a little bit, if segment membership was not sensitive data, it would be very obvious what to do here, right? First thing, you agree on some preliminaries. You agree on a way to express an ad request, to express a segment description, and how to identify people, the customers, or in the case of the publisher, the users. So you would do that, then you'd have an offline phase of the ad selection protocol, just performed every once in a while. The advertiser would send ordered lists of segment descriptions and customer IDs to the ad tech company. Now, why do they have to be ordered? Because he's also going to send a segment membership table. It's a binary matrix where the CS entry is a one, if and only if customer C is in segment S. And he's also going to send, for every segment, an appropriate ad to be served if it is determined that the most important thing about this particular ad request is that the user is in this segment. Now, you also need a generic ad because there will be users who are not yet customers of this advertiser, and he's going to want to show them something that might entice them. Okay, so the ad tech company also has to fix an objective function in which to evaluate what is the best ad, given this ad request and this list of segments, real valued objective function. And then the online phase, this is performed very often, once for every ad request, billions of times a day. So the publisher could just send a user ID and an ad request to the ad tech company. And the ad tech company could look to see whether that user is in the membership table. And if he is, then serve an ad for a segment that maximizes the value of the objective function for this ad request and that segment. It's not in the membership table you serve the generic ad. Now, why do you need both a user ID and an ad request? A user ID is just that. It's something like an email address. It identifies a person. An ad request will tell you something about the context of this um, slot that the advertiser wants to fill. They'll, for example, say, this is the website or this is the kind of website that this user is looking at, this kind of page. We know who the publisher is, but we might not know which page. Like, is he looking at the sports page? Is he looking at the editorial page? Whatever. Okay, the ad, and it will also say something like the dimensions of the ad. Is this supposed to be an ad of only text and images? Can you also have audio and video? Stuff like that. All right, so why doesn't this straw man protocol, that was obviously a straw man protocol, why isn't that a complete solution? Or why isn't whatever we're doing now a complete solution? Well, the mapping from users to segments is personal data. Personal data is a GDPR term. So it is very deeply, but not exclusively, concerned with data that are linked to an identified or identifiable individual. And like everything else in this biz, it's not a precisely mathematically defined. And it is constantly being mulled over. And it can be generalized and enforced more strictly or made more strict explicitly as it is adopted in later regulations. So as a, yes. One segment, yes, yes. That's why you might have, not only might it belong to more than one segment, they might have the same objective function value. But that's not interesting. Don't worry about that. OK, so um, given that this personal data issue has been an issue for a long time and is being dealt with satisfactorily by Amazon and other ad tech companies, um, but it's in flux. It's, it's sort of a moving target. So the whole ad, online ad business is concerned. Customers, legislators, and regulators are increasingly focused on the use and transfer of personal data in online advertising. And e-commerce companies are responding. We're trying to figure out, can we do good ad selection 
and reveal less or ideally no personal data to any party that doesn't already have it. Note that the advertiser already has a lot of personal data on his customers, but that's not an ad tech company's concern. That's not an ad tech company's responsibility. So this, oops, what? Hmm. What's going on here? You know, we put a lot of effort into ensuring that this thing would not go to sleep, and it just did. What's going on here? Ah, here we are. Good. OK, so this project is part of that response. We always want to figure out what we can do, what more can we do with less personal data. OK. So the core weakness of the straw man protocol, of course, is that some personal data are revealed, perhaps unnecessarily. So I won't go through all these examples. You can come up with them yourself. But for example, in, in that straw man protocol, the ad tech company learns the identity of the user who's visiting the publisher's website. Now, that's, as it turns out, not necessary. OK, so we, ideally, we would like a protocol that reveals no personal data to any party that didn't already know it. In practice, it would be a big step forward to have a protocol where we could just completely characterize the personal data that are revealed and use the vast edifice of cryptographic theory to prove that those are the, uh, those are the only personal data that are revealed. OK, so parts of this problem have known solutions, long known. So for example, we know how to express ad requests and segment descriptions using only contextual data. Now, contextual data, like personal data, the GDPR term, that is not precisely defined. So it's the kind of stuff I was talking about before. Like, here's the dimensions of the ad, or these are users who are interested in this category of merchandise, stuff like that. OK. And it is, although I can't define it, and I don't think anyone could define it mathematically, the ad business knows what it means by contextual data, and it knows whether a segment description is using only contextual data. So this is a non-problem. OK, you can basically think of contextual data as not personal data. All right, so also, this thing, this very much surprised me. It's possible for the ad tech company to serve the ad to the user without exposing the ad or in fact, without exposing any personal data to the publisher. The ad tech company can somehow send the ad directly to the user without going through any channel that the publisher is observing. I find that sort of surprising. So, exactly, what? what exactly is Facebook? A publisher. A publisher. Well, I mean, actually, Facebook could serve any of these roles, right? Facebook does advertise. I hear a whole bunch of Instagram ads for how you can meet your sweetheart on Instagram every time I turn on the radio. Facebook certainly serves ads. So it either is an ad tech company or it's employing an ad tech company. And Facebook is certainly a publisher. Facebook is a place where users are shown selected ads. No, 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 no. These, there are single organizations that can serve any one of these roles. Amazon actually is one of them. But in any given execution of, an, of the online phase of ad selection, there are three well-defined parties playing three different roles. No. An ad tech company. All right. No, no, no. If, if Facebook is using its own ad technology, then this is not the right protocol for that, for that ad service, for that ad selection instance. OK. Facebook probably is. But yes. And maybe Amazon does too. I actually don't know. But the point is, this is a perfectly common scenario where you have three different parties. OK? And it's perfectly reasonable to say you would like to execute ad selection without having the ad tech company learn which ad this user sees. 
because that could reveal personal data about this user. Or, you know, whatever. The point is you don't want to reveal anything you don't have to. And it turns out there's a, like, just a, like, network protocol way to do that, which surprises me. I figured when I see an ad on the New York Times website, the New York Times knows what I'm seeing. But not necessarily. There's a way to just, and, and apparently everybody else at Amazon knew that. I didn't, but now I know. Okay, so other things that are solved. You have these descriptions of ad requests and segments that are not numerical. They're so-called categorical descriptions. There is apparently very standard ML techniques that allow the ad, te the ad tech company to create an embedding sigma that could take an ad request or a segment description and embed it in an n-dimensional real vector space. This is standard stuff, not my stuff, but I guess people tell me this is a solved problem. So n, the n could be as few as a few dozens. It could be as many as a few hundreds. Now, I mentioned the objective function. For this exercise, and apparently very commonly, the objective function that is used to determine the quality of an ad for segment S, if the ad request is R, is just the dot product of these embeddings. Okay? And the reason that that is supposedly a good way to evaluate the quality of ads is that it, the top K segments for a given request can be found very efficiently. And it's also highly compatible with clustering. And if we have time at the end of this talk, I'll tell you where clustering comes in. But anyway, we don't have to worry about, oh crap. We don't have to worry about defining the, um, the, the objective function. OK. So all right, we, I, we have to do something about this. What's going on? What should I do? All right, so I just unplugged. Would that? Is it, are you connected to the, to the laptop? All right, so we put the laptop on don't sleep. Should we not have done that? I don't think it's a sleep issue. Yeah, I think it's a connection sleeping. problem. A connection problem, OK. Yeah, so. Oh, what? yeah, it's definitely the dongle. It's, it's the dongle? Yeah, here. OK. Let's try, I'm just going to deconnect it and reconnect it, because sometimes it takes a second. OK. Yeah, okay. that's what we do. Here, give it just like a second. So the problem with yeah. moving it is that it's a Mac PowerPoint deck. Okay. That's why I wanted to use Now, I could convert it to PDF. OK, let's try this. Yes. And if necessary, I'll just create a PDF file and use it on me. OK, all right, so slideshow, play from current slide. OK, so parts of this problem have known solutions. We're done with that. And now, um, so for the rest of what we need to solve, we're mostly going to use cryptographic computing. Now, that's not just all of cryptography. This is a body of technique, a huge body of technique, within the cryptographic theory field, aimed at the goal of using confidential data without fully revealing it. Now, I can't possibly go into you know, very much about the essence of cryptographic computing, but you've probably seen a canonical example of a, secure, of a cryptographic computing technique, which is MPC, Secure Multiparty Computation. So I have this little diagram here, which uh, JP Hubo from EPFL let me use. You have N parties. They each have a private input, X sub I. And their goal is they want to compute a function of all of, this, of the union of their inputs, the whole set of inputs. Now, this function, note, can actually be a whole vector. So it could be that party i gets yi and party j gets a different yj. Anyway, they want to compute the prescribed outputs in such a way that the only thing that, that, first of all, it's correct. They get the prescribed output. And the only thing they learn is the output. So nothing about the private inputs of the other party that is not revealed by the output is learned. OK? So 
So you've probably seen this diagram before and heard that description before, that description of MPC. Now, what is the state of the art of MPC? Very strong, very general, positive results. It can be done, in theory, in a very wide variety of scenarios, of system models, of adversary models, very successful theory. So more on the state of cryptographic computing and its role in my life in personal reflections. All right, so what is our basic protocol? So as I just told you, <laughs> MPC supposedly can just about always be done. And furthermore, there are so-called compilers where you could take a protocol description of a protocol that is not privacy preserving and compile it into a protocol that is privacy preserving. So what's the obvious way forward? Well, I gave you a straw man protocol that's a solution that is a two-phase, three-party protocol that solves the problem, but it reveals personal data. So why don't we use one of those compilers to construct an MP3, uh, an MPC, two-phase, three-party protocol that solves the same problem, but it doesn't reveal, it doesn't unnecessarily reveal personal data. That unnecessarily is a, that that clause I used before. It might be that something about XJ is revealed simply by YI. Can't do anything about that. If you're going to give the results, anything you could, that you can logically conclude from those results is revealed, you don't reveal anything else. So why don't we just use the known general techniques? And the problem, because we basically, for the online protocol, we need something very fast. This has to be done, the total amount of time that you have is in between the click and the ad is served. So that's very fast. If you use one of these generic compilers, you'll get a, a protocol that's much too slow. All right, so what are the technical ingredients that we use to arrive at a faster protocol? Well, one is not cryptographic, that's cuckoo hashing. Now, every, I told you everything I know about ads I learned from Gong. Everything I know about cuckoo hashing, I learned from God. Not much, but I don't think we need much. Now, we also use a bunch of cryptographic techniques. Um, so I know that since Mahalis has never worked in cryptography, there are very few cryptography people in the room. Although there is one very eminent cryptography person whose work is going to be mentioned in a few slots. Okay, so that's Benny Pincus. But, I am not going to like go into a ton of cryptographic detail. I'm going to go into almost no cryptographic detail. Um, there are four things we use, oblivious transfer and garbled circuits. Those I'm not going to try to explain how they work at all. I'm just going to tell you what properties they have that make them suitable for this protocol. And I am going to try to describe additive secret sharing and secret share re-randomization because I don't think you really need to know any cryptography. It's very, very simple stuff and it's cute but I might run out of time. I think I have a little extra time because of all of the delays. So, okay, what is cuckoo hashing? Basically, it's a way that you can construct a hash table that is parameterized by the number of rows, that's capital N, and a small number, K, very small, like K could be two or three in our application, of hash functions. Now, this is hashing like in data structures, not cryptographic hashing. So hashes, hash functions h1 through hk. Now what's going to be stored in this table? A, a bunch of key value pairs, um, fewer than n, however. Um, so the property we have here is that each row of the hash table holds at most one key value pair. And if the key x occurs in this table, it has to occur in one of k rows, h1 of x through hk of x, mod n, of course. So we can look up a key. We can determine whether the key is in there with a constant number of lookups, and if it is in there, we find it. All right, so the hash table looks something like this. This is one of the slides that Eric made. So, um, so the hexadecimal notation, for example, is not something that would ever have occurred to me. Okay, so um, what is a key here? A key is a user ID. So think an um, email address. Okay, so one thing about email addresses is that they are a very widely varying lengths. For a table, we need a fixed width um, key. 
All right, so basically, um, we're going to use a 30, or we have used in the prototype implementation, a 32-bit hash value of the key. Okay, now why are these keys important? Remember, at some point, without revealing anything, because we're doing cryptographic computing, we have to figure out whether the email address of this user of the publisher's site occurs in the segment membership table of the advertiser. So we have to be able to, you know, if we weren't worrying about privacy, we'd have to be able to quickly hash those email addresses and find them in the cuckoo hash table. First, hash them to a 32-bit value, then apply X1, H1 through HK to that 32-bit value to determine whether it's in the, in the table. Okay, so the number N of rows is going to be greater than the number of customers because of hash collisions. So that means there are a number of rows that are zeros. Those zeros are rows of this initially empty table that were never filled in because there was no customer ID that hashed to that, that, to that row. Okay, so um, those are actually hexadecimal 8-bit values, but what we actually use is 32-bit values. Okay, so now we get to secret sharing. That's the table. We have the key is the hash of the user ID. The value is the segment membership bits. So here we have five segments. And if you look at the first row, that user is in segments one and three. That's what that means. Okay, so 32-bit user IDs and binary segment membership vectors. All right, now we get to secret sharing. Okay, so what is secret sharing? Party C could share a secret element of Z, Z sub Q. Q doesn't have to be prime, but actually it often is, and in fact it's often two, between parties A and B. How do you do that? Simplest thing you can imagine. Party C chooses a uniformly at random an element of Z sub Q. That's A's share. The angle brackets with the subscript A that means A's share. B, B's share is just X minus A's share, mod Q. Okay, additive secret sharing. If A and B got together, and he gives, you know, gives the two shares. Now, if A and B got together, of course, they could add their shares and discover X. But in the absence of collusion between A and B, neither A nor B has any information at all about what X is. For every possible X, if I'm A, for every possible X, there is exactly one value that B's share could be that would give us that value of X, and I don't know anything about B's share. Okay, so you don't have to share over Z mod Q. You could share over any finite additive group. I thought all additive groups were a billion, but I was told by the last person who looked at this slide that that's not true. Okay, so and also C could share a whole row obviously, and they don't all have to come from the same group. C could just go through the whole row for each component of the row, construct the shares, and then all at once give shares of one row, to, one share of the row to A and another share of the row to B. So since I'm short on time, I won't belabor this, but that's exactly what the advertiser is going to do with his segment membership table. He starts with his segment membership table, that's over at, on the left, and then separately for each component of the row, the ID and each segment membership bit, he creates secret shares. Okay? Now he's going to give one share to the ad tech company and one to the publisher. So key point about making progress in the, the political part of this, the socio-technical part of this work. The validity of this protocol rests on the fact that a secret share of an item of personal data is not itself personal data. Now, I just showed you how secret shares are constructed, so we know technically that is a fact. But, <laughs> It's technically a fact, but it would still have to be sold to regulators and to business people and to everybody involved. 
that this is legit. No, you're not allowed to release a membership table. Actually, I don't know whether that's true, but ideally you would not release a membership table, but you can release shares of a membership table. Okay, that's a take home message. All right, so now we can say what the offline phase of our protocol is. It's exactly what you think it is. The advertiser creates the segment descriptions. He assigns the num a numbering to them so they can be columns in a table. He constructs the cuckoo hash table and the secret shares. He sends the segment descriptions. Remember, those are not personal data. They're only contextual data. He sends the segment descriptions and the numbering thereof and one share of the table to the ad tech company. He sends the other share to the publisher. OK, that's the offline phase. Now, what do we need for the online phase? Well, we need secret sharing, which I already showed you. We need one out of them oblivious transfer. So I won't explain how this works at all, but it's a, it's a cute idea. There's a two-party protocol where the parties are a sender and a receiver. The sender has an M element set, vector, I guess, since there is such a thing as the ith element. The receiver has an index i. They run a protocol, and at the end of that protocol, the receiver has learned xi. Only xi, not the other x's. And the sender has learned nothing at all. And in particular, the sender has not learned i. All right? So the interesting thing about one, for our purposes, for one out of MOT, is that it can be done in one communication round. Okay? One message from receiver to sender and one from sender to receiver. All right, now, another thing we need is re-randomization of additive secret shares. So if A and B have their shares of X, to compute fresh independent shares of X with just one message, how do we do it? It's very simple. A chooses a uniformly at random another element of the group, subtracts that new element from her share, sends the difference to B, and then B takes what he's received, that's this rightmost term in the first line over here on the bottom right, the rightmost term, x share A minus Y. He takes what he's received and he adds it to his share. And then all you need is associativity of addition in the group and you get that when he, that difference, if you, if you call that x sub b prime, the new share, that if you add that new share of b to the new share of a, you get x. OK? All right? Yes? Yes. Yes. OK. And, in, and also, we, in, more, more readily, we assume that a, more, more importantly, we assume that a and b are not communicating, except Oh, according to the protocol. We assume that they are honest but curious participants in this protocol. Okay. Or it's sometimes called the semi-honest adversary model. Okay, so if you have shares, you can construct with just one message and some local computation, you can construct new, fresh, completely random shares. All right, so this is the one cryptographic gadget that we sort of invented. It's very simple, but I haven't seen it described anywhere else. We call it the Rossi. So party A has secret shares of a table. Party B has an index J and a corresponding share, obviously, of um, the Jth row of the table. And at the end of the protocol, we want A and B to have learned fresh independent shares of that row of the table and nothing else. And in particular, A does not learn the index J. And this can be accomplished with one communication round using a combination of one out of M oblivious transfer and additive secret share re-randomization. OK, now I have to know how much time I have left. Fifteen minutes. OK. Fifteen? OK. <laughs> So I should probably not then present everything that I prepared. Oh, well, really too bad we had this technical problems. Okay, Rossi. Now, 
Um, this is how you do the Rossi using OT and re-randomization. Now, what is the Rossi's crucial role in the basic protocol? So they each have, the ad tech company and the publisher each has a share of the, the segment membership table. The publisher has a very small number of rows, J1 through JK, in which if this user is actually in that table, he's in one of those K rows. So we have those two parties execute K independent Rossi's in parallel. And at the end of that exchange, which can be done in one communication round, what we have is that the ad tech company has fresh random shares of K rows of the membership table. He does not know which rows they are. Okay, and he does not know the key U, which is the user's identity information, because it's shared, you know. So there is nothing, and from these, from these new random shares, of the K appropriate rows of the membership table, we, we will be able to compute the optimal segment. But nothing that he has learned, this is the key point, this will be enough information to compute the optimal segment or to determine there is no segment, but nothing he has learned would allow him to identify or track the user U. Because all he knows is he has a share of K rows, he doesn't know which rows they are. If, and, you know, if some other user comes along who may or may not be you, he'll get K more completely random shares of this table, and he won't know whether they are the same or, or disjoint or overlapping with the previous rows. So he won't be able to track you. Okay, so I had a, d a detailed description of why that's actually a simple computation can't go into it for lack of time. So let me just say that how do we use this information that we get from the Rossi's to compute the optimal segment? We use a garbled circuit. Okay, so basically a garbled circuit is a way of doing a circuit evaluation, not on plain text bits, but on encrypted bits. You go gate by gate through the circuit and you perform the logical operations on ciphertexts you get new ciphertext, you keep going till you get the output, and then the designated party can decrypt it. And neither the encrypted inputs nor any of the encrypted intermediate values reveal information about the plain text inputs. Okay, so again, I can't really describe much about this, but there is this fabulous paper by Benny Pincus and three other people that shows that there is a very efficient way to do one round garbled circuit, construction, and evaluation. All right, so this is basically a summary of everything I just said for the online phase. This is the two round, this is the flow diagram for the two round protocol that we have for the online phase. And uh, the nifty thing about this is there are three conceptual steps, but you can actually do for the first substantive round from the ad tech company to the publisher, you can do heavy duty Rossi and garbled circuit action. Okay, so we get a two round, we believe efficient protocol. All right, what guarantees can we make? Remember what I said is, what we wanna do is precisely characterize the, in, the personal data that are revealed and then prove that actually that's all that's revealed. Okay, so one execution of the online phase does actually reveal something to the ad tech company. He reveals that either you was not in that membership table at all, or which is a most valuable segment in that it maximizes the objective function for that ad request. Okay, which segment is this user in? that maximizes the objective function. All right, so our claim is that's all that's revealed in one execution of the online phase. Again, the truth of this claim depends crucially on everybody believing, which is true, 
but it's a mathematical fact and how it flies in the non-mathematical world is as yet to be determined, that encryptions of personal data and shares of personal data are not themselves personal data. Okay, now is this good enough? Okay, you have learned that some user is in this segment. Might be in other segments, but those would be less valuable. Okay. So it's not clear whether that is considered a big revelation or not. Gong tells me no. There's lots of ideas that we have for how you could not even reveal that, but most of them seem to make the protocol too slow. But we're still working. OK, so note that there is a problem here in that um, if you have repeated executions, you can determine that two different executions must have been for two different users. Again, is that a serious problem or not? I don't know. I guarantee you that this protocol certainly reveals less personal data than a lot of stuff that is in use today. I shouldn't say I guarantee. That's my understanding. I'm not knowledgeable enough about ad tech, but that's what I think. This would be an improvement. Would it be good enough? I'm not sure. The offline phase reveals some information, but none of it appears to be personal or, in fact, particularly sensitive in any way. Like, you give an upper bound on the number of customers of this advertiser. You can make it a very, like, big upper bound by putting in a lot of zeros. So, again, all I can tell you is the people in the ads org, they're not, they're not concerned about that. Okay, so that's the protocol. I had some open problems and ongoing improvements, but I think I'm running short of time. Like, I have five minutes left or something? Eight, Eight minutes. All right. So then let me just say that one improvement we're working on is not using individual segments, but rather using clusters of segments, because the circuit size of this, the circuits that, we, that, we, that the garbler constructs here um, has a number of AND gates that's lower bounded by N log N, where N is the number of segments. And some advertisers have hundreds of thousands of segments. So if you had 200,000 segments, that would require more than 3.5 million AND gates, which would not work. So if you cluster the segments and you choose not the objective function maximizing segment, but an objective function maximizing cluster, you have, the ad tech company has control over the circuit size. He can make bigger clusters and have smaller circuits, and that's good. Um, but of course, that means that you have to give up something else. So it turns out you lose something in terms of the utility of the objective function, which isn't hard to understand, but I don't have time to explain it. If you think about it, you'll see why. And also, you have to reveal more information. The advertiser would have to learn the cluster. And if this segment embedding, this, this, this sigma function, which is learned with an ML model, if that's um, ad tech company proprietary, that might not be so good. OK, so there's a trade-off. If you want to get more efficiency, you wind up having to give up some utility, or you might have to give up some utility. And you also might have to give up some information. And that sort of shows. Uh, the truth of a motto that I've adopted ever since I started like getting into actual um, deployed technology, which is there are no solutions, only trade-offs. So I don't know whether anyone else in this room except Benny is interested in getting involved in deployed technology, but if you're going to do it, there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. Okay, personal reflection. So why am I presenting this work? You might be thinking about this. It's not really clever cryptography or even very new cryptography. In fact, most of it's quite old cryptography. I'm not someone who cares about ads. And by that, I don't mean I'm an ad hater. I meet people in, as I go through my work who really just rail against you know, you know, targeted advertising. I don't care. I don't care about it, targeted advertising. I can ignore ads very well. I used to do it when I watched TV. <laughs> I can still do it. Anyway, so why am I talking about this? Well, because it actually um, helped me partly resolve something I've been struggling with for nearly 40 years, more than 40 years. 
something I've been struggling with since 1982, fall of 1982, which was about a year after I met Mahalis, actually, although he had nothing to do with my getting into this struggle. <laughs> okay, so these personal reflections are my own. They're not those of Amazon or my collaborators on this project. Okay, so I, ours is a cryptographic computing solution. Now, I showed you one paradigmatic problem from cryptographic computing, that's MPC, where you have the complete graph of the N parties and they compute the N outputs without revealing the N inputs. It's actually a much bigger theory than that. And it began in fall of 82 with the Yao Millionaires paper. You have two millionaires, one has you know, uh, K millions, the other one has uh, N millions, and they want to figure out which one has more without revealing any other information about how much they actually have. So that was uh, the Yao Millionaire's paper. It's a very famous paper. And the way he solved it was with garbled circuits. So that was the beginning of garbled circuits, which was the beginning of secure multi-party computation. In that case, it was secure two-party computation, later generalized to n parties. And cryptographic computing goes uh, further than that, there is something called private information retrieval. There is the, the holy grail of fully HE, fully homomorphic encryption, where you can take any F that you want to compute, and instead of computing F on plain text data, you can encrypt X. That gets you your encrypted, encrypted input, X prime. You, can pre, you compute G of X prime. You get Y prime, that's an encrypted output, and then you decrypt it. This is actually doable for any F. This was this amazing result of Craig Gentry, um, I think in 2009. He was a Stanford student of Dan Bonet. So there's a ton of work in this cryptographic computing field. And as I said earlier, what is cryptographic computing? Well, the most general description would be it's about how do you use data without revealing them? How do you take pro valuable data possibly owned by multiple parties, do a computation, not simply locally on your own machine, but that involves some kind of interaction with other people, and get the answer and not reveal the data. So when I saw this Yao's millionaire, Millionaire's paper, I must say I was just blown away. I thought, and this was in fall of 82. I said, oh, that's the answer. You know, that's the answer. There's, there's, no, there's no data privacy problems anymore. You just, you never put any plain text data on a networked machine. You know, you never reveal your plain text data to anyone. If you need to do a joint computation, you just send them encrypted data. Okay, so in the 40 plus years since the Yao Millionaire's paper, cryptographic computing has been a spectacular success as a research area, but it has had quite limited practical deployment. There was a big, funding agency push about 10 or 15 years ago, and I think actually the phrase cryptographic computing is from the IARPA Hector program. Okay, so all these years I've been watching this thing unfold and wondering what's going on here. Why isn't this in widespread use? It seems so obviously useful. Well, I joined Amazon in October 2018, right at the beginning of the scholars program, and the reason I did it is because I thought, okay, so in September of 2018, I turned 60. Now, I thought, hmm, I'm 60. I might be retiring before too long. Although I see Mahalis and Christus and Jeff Ullman and Bob Tajan, and maybe computer scientists don't retire, but I am not a Superman, and I am like them, and I probably will retire at some point. Not yet, however. And I thought, gee, what is it, like, what, what do I really want to know? What do I want to do? What do I want to study? What do I want to accomplish? And I said, this is what I want. I want to either see cryptographic computing deployed at scale, really used to solve actual problems, or I want to understand why it is not being used. I mean, we all know there are such things as, you know, they look, this looks good on paper, but in reality, it doesn't work. I want to understand this. I want to resolve this before I retire. And 
Like around the late teens, when I went to Amazon as a scholar, um, I, so far I figured AWS would be a good, good place to, to explore this. It was a good time because a lot of people believed that cryptographic computing was about to take off commercially. There was a lot of trade press articles about Gentry's result, even though it was already an old result, but that's when it started. There was a lot of funding for startups. There was also this explosion of commercially valuable data for which cryptographic computing might be useful. So I go to Amazon, I said, okay, deploy or debunk. I want to straighten this out in my own mind. So it's almost five years now, and still unresolved, but I have learned one thing, and it's made me hopeful. So a lot of us in the theory, the theory world, we're thinking about cryptographic computing in terms of user-facing deployment like single users deciding, I want to use this cloud computing or I want to do this multi-party computation with my personal data. Am I willing to pay for this service? And there have been a few user-facing deployments, but they serve tiny niche markets. Like there is the oft-mentioned Danish sugar beet auction. Okay? They, um, uh, they actually did um, uh, implement, now I'm spacing on this guy's name, who's the Dane who was responsible for this? Damgard, right. Even Damgard, a great cryptography person in uh, Denmark, he and some colleagues created a system that would allow Danish sugar beet farmers to bid in a privacy preserving manner on sugar beet contracts. And they loved it. They used to get ripped off, and now you know they were they were much more able to um, you know make a profit with their sugar beets. Um, there was a, a well a, a um, publicized to some extent use of it for gender based wage gaps in the Boston area. You know other things where there's an academic implementation of a certain cryptographic computing protocol aimed at a specific scenario, and some of them have gotten used, but not that many. Okay. There are some services that have been constructed that are more broadly aimed and able to do more general computation, but they tend to place significant cognitive and data management requirements on users. In particular, they tend to require client-side encryption. So from a cloud computing point of view, that's a dicey thing. Because a lot of people, when they decide to use cloud computing, it's in part because they don't want to deal with, with client-side encryption. Now, What's different about this case? It's an infrastructural application. Okay? It's a system level application. If it were adopted, it would be adopted by the advertiser, the publisher, and the ad tech company. And it would be adopted because they really have a threat from restrictions on use of personal data. And it's going to hurt their business if they can't use something that is more protective of personal data. And they could just roll it out, and end users would have nothing to do with this. They wouldn't even know it was there. They wouldn't have to decide to use it. They wouldn't have to pay for it. It would just work. And it would work to solve a problem that companies really want to solve. So if this gets rolled out, that will be why. And there is actually a precedent. Those of you who use uh, Google uses privacy-preserving federated learning. I have a former PhD student who was involved in this project. When you use your smartphone and you like get predictive type, like it tells you, oh, you know, it's like it, it, it guesses what the next word is, and you either select it or not. And you can ignore this altogether if you want to. I have RSI, so I often use it. I have a re repetitive strain injury, so I often use it. And the way that works is they construct a model centralized sort of um, um, sort of um, like the default model using extensive training data, carefully selected training data. They push it out into phones, and then as you use it, the, the software customizes this model for your, your writing and your email and your usage. So it's, there's all this wisdom being collected in a distributed fashion. And periodically, it is sucked up into the central node and aggregated, and a better centralized model, a better default model is constructed. 
And they do that using what's called secure aggregation, which is a cryptographic computing protocol. So there is, there is one example, there is an existence proof that system level compu cryptographic computing can work on a large scale. So I think this is another such example that can work. So I think One question? Moshe asks good questions. Not the vast majority. There are a lot. There, you're thinking only of mega publishers. There are a lot of you small mean, publishers. Know, yes. The volume of publishing. Yes. Looking dollars. Uh huh. Then a huge segment of the advertising is happening on the. Website. All right. So I don't know whether that's true, but even if that is true, there's still an issue of the personal data that the advertiser has. It's the advertiser has the most personal data. And he will not want to reveal it or may not be allowed to reveal it to the other so two parties. Let me give you a complete scenario. Uh -huh. I purchased something on Amazon on my wife's computer on her Amazon account. Mm -hmm. Then on my Facebook post, mm -hmm. I started the advertisement mm -hmm. for similar products. Right. And this is all kosher because somehow it happened to this is what? This is all kosher, it's okay. Um, well, it's obviously it's kosher now. No one's getting arrested for it. But it may not be forever. There may be a requirement at some point that that personal data, namely the fact that you bought something and that you and your wife, that you are married to your wife, may not be freely revealable. And cryptographic computing could, could solve that. Anyway, believe me, there, yes, there are times when the ad tech company and the publisher are the same, but there are a lot of times when they're not. OK, thank you. OK, our uh, next speaker is uh, Ruta Mehta, who is a professor at uh, computer science at UIUC. Her research uh, focuses on economics, and computation, per division, and interdisciplinary applications of it to machine learning evolution areas. Her work has been recognized by many awards, including the NSF Career Award, and earlier, an uh, ACM uh, uh, India Doctoral Dissertation Award, and uh, uh, she was named as a rising star in. Um, uh, in 2013, and for a, a quick uh, personal note, um, Ruda is one of uh, those people that have the uh, privilege to have worked on something and solved something uh, that Mikhail has also been working on, um, <laughs> and, and, and it was faster. So like back in around 2013, we were working with Mikhail in system, or trying to understand or like, prove uh, that um, yeah, the, compu the actual complexity of finding a, a real, approximating a real fixed point or uh, a, a real market equilibrium uh, for the obvious market is fixed uh, complete and we were having some approach and we were trying and it was not working and then at some point we, we learned that uh, rotability is in a completely different, ingenious way. Um, the task was particularly uh, I didn't know the story. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you. It's my honor to be here. I was here 10 years back when we were celebrating 60th birthday of Mihalis. And I was attending at that time. And so happy to meet everyone. And especially Mihalis. That was first interaction with Mihalis. Um, and it was all pleasure. It was really. Nice, and at that time he told us about this problem only on TF markets, and uh, yeah, I didn't know that, uh, <laughs> uh, but that's great to know. <laughs> thank you, Mihalis. Thank you for all the support always, um, and I'm really happy. Although I just came for this one last day, I'm so happy that I made it, 
and uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. So today, <coughs> I, have, I was debating, actually, I bugged Kosha a lot, what should I talk about, and whether it should be on fair division, or whether it should be on equilibrium computation, and finally decided this is what I want to talk about, um, because I think Mihalis and many other people in the audience, Christos, even Kusha, Dimitris, they will, all of these people have worked on this problem in some or the other capacity, and probably uh, they'll enjoy um, the talk and this new twist to the question. Okay, so today I'm going to, whenever we talk about markets, because this is where the question comes from, we always think of buying things, people buying things, and it's market of goods. But I'm going to switch it around and talk about markets of chores, okay? And equilibrium computation for such a market. And why would we think about this? Well, uh, I'm a theoretician, so I'm happy to think about whatever I feel like. But if you care about applications, there are lots of applications in ride sharing, task rabbit, all of these are chores market. Um, <laughs> because of very nice properties of market equilibrium, they have been used in fair division as well, where you want to uh, kind of allocate, let's say, a bunch of things to agents. They have different preferences, and you want to do it in a fair and efficient manner. This, again, has lots of applications. Um, air traffic man management at the time of bad weather, school seat assignment, vaccine assignment, kidney exchange. You want to, uh, dissolving a uh, company, you want to divide assets and liabilities, or you want to divide the work or budget between different wings of um, defense. Uh, so lots of applications. Um, Theoretically, let me tell you what the question we are trying to solve. So we have a bunch of agents with different different preferences over a set of items. For now, I'm not going to make any assumptions about the item. They can be goods that they want to consume, like milk or bread, or they can be chores, like work. Okay. And they have their preferences are given by a concave function, which is typical in economics, which basically tries to capture decreasing marginal returns. So this is my setup, set of agents, set of items. Items, I'm going to assume they are divisible. And every agent, their preference is given by a concave function over the amount of items that they consume. OK? OK, and the question is to find a competitive equilibrium. Now, what do I mean by competitive equilibrium? Well, again, the term comes from the market. So there has to be some prices. So imagine a bunch of agents, or you, if you wish, you can think of them as buyers as well. And there are a set of goods. Typically, market, we go buy stuff. So let's just start with a traditional setting where there are a bunch of goods on the market on sale. And these agents want to buy some of them. You set prices. Now, depending on how much money they have and what they like, they're going to buy what they like the best and can also afford. OK? So based on these two conditions that how much can they afford, and based on whatever money they have, they might be able to afford different, different sets of bundles. But from that, they're going to buy what they like the best. OK? So that gives every agent their optimal bundle. Every agent buys their optimal bundle subject to the budget constraint. This gives us demand for every good. When you aggregate the demand, from all the agents for each good, you get the aggregate demand for the good. OK? And we say that these prices are at equilibrium if demand equals supply. This is the basic principle of market or economics. Right? Demand equals supply means equilibrium. Okay? And if the prices are not at equilibrium, they tend to adjust. If demand is more, the prices will increase. If demand is less, the price will decrease, and so on. So I'm not going into that. But this is kind of intuitively the definition of equilibrium. You set the prices at the price. Every agent buys what they like the best and can afford. That gives us a demand. At, at, we say that these prices are at equilibrium if demand equals supply for every item. OK, any question about the notion of equilibrium? OK. And we say that these prices are at competitive uh, Competitive equilibrium with equal income if we assume that every agent has equal money to buy. So let's assume that every agent has $1 to buy from. 
And then whatever it prices, equilibrium prices come out, we call it CEEI. Okay? Okay. Now I just, in the previous slide, said that commutative equilibrium is a very important notion within fair division as well. So let me try to convince you why. Now suppose you have one dollar, I have one dollar, we see in some set of prices, okay? I buy something, say I buy bread, and you go for milk. What does that mean? That you like milk more than bread to buy from that one dollar, right? That means that you will not envy my bundle, whatever I bought, right? We both had the same one dollar, we both are facing the same prices, okay? If you buy your bundle instead of mine, that means you want your bundle more than mine. That means you will not envy my bundle. Okay, that's a very important property in fair division, which is called nobody envies anybody else's bundle, or nobody envies anybody else's allocation. They like their own allocation more than anybody else's allocation. So immediately, envy freeness falls out. Okay? Next, if everybody has the same one dollar, and we are at equilibrium, that means total price will be total money, then everybody should be able to get the value they get must be at least proportional. That is, total value they get from the entire set of items divided by n. Right? We are also using concavity property here. Okay? So, you get proportionality. From first welfare theorem, we also get that the allocation is going to be Pareto optimal among all possible feasible allocations. Okay? And for a wide range of valuation functions, from eisenberg gale convex program, we also get that the final allocation maximizes the Nash welfare. What is a welfare means sum of the values. Nash welfare means product of the values. And in economics, we go after product and not sum to maintain scale invariance. Okay, so if you, sum, if you maximize sum of the values and somebody, suppose, bumps up their values very, very large, then you will give everything to that agent, which is bad. So in economics, it might be that somebody is expressing their values in dollars, somebody is expressing their values in rupees. That should not change the outcome. And product maintains scale invariance. Okay? So that's, and there are many other properties that uh, we get, but just wanted to convince you that this is an important notion in fair division as well. Um, and it has a long, long history, okay? Uh, this is a history in, say, before the computer scientists uh, started thinking about the problem. But as soon as computer scientists start uh, starting with work of Mihalis, Krustos, um, we start, uh, Magido, we started thinking about the complexity of equilibrium. Uh, uh, so the initial works were on Nash, but then immediately, I think simultaneously in Krustos' paper, he also talked about market equilibrium. And it's the connection with PPAD. Um, so, before computer scientists, uh, Eisenberg Gale gave a convex programming formulation when the utility functions are one homogeneous, and it is based on this maximizing the Nash welfare. And there are many such convex programming formulations. There are strongly polynomial time algorithms, simplex like algorithms, lots of complexity theory results, and many people here have worked on many of these problems. And this list is nowhere exhaustive. Okay, so um, Mihalis, uh, Shi Chen, and there's uh, Dimitris has worked on it, Manolis has worked on it, I mean, okay, so <laughs> I cannot actually uh, cite all the references exhaustively here, uh, but yeah, lots of work. <clears throat> and there are recent uh, work on this very nice uh, highland Jacauser market in the good setting and so on. Okay, but what do you mean by markets for chores? Okay, who are going to go to the market, give money to consume chores? Are you going to go and say, give me work, I'll give you money? No, it has to be, the money flow has to be other way around. You will go to the market and consume chores because you want to earn money, right? So now the budget is the earning requirement of the agents, okay? and the money flow is reversed, and that's why I represent it with a negative price. That means that now agents will consume the chores and get paid for it. 
and this payment is going to satisfy their earning requirement. So when you set the prices, they will know which set of chores will give them the minimum disutility or pain subject to earning some specific amount of money. Okay? So subject to the earning requirement, again, it's the same thing. They will demand their optimal bundle subject to their earning requirement and aggregate the demand. Then demand should be equal to supply at equilibrium. And we say that it is equal income if every agent has exactly the same earning requirement, which is, let's say, $1. Okay? So we are just reversing the money flow. Everything else remains the same. Okay? And, okay, you would wonder, what do you mean by mixed when you have goods and chores both? Well, then you have to actually, in the most general theoretical setting, you will allow an item to be a good for some agent and a chore for some another agent. So first, you have to demarcate what are the goods and the chores. Goods will get positive price, chores will get negative price. And you have to be careful when you define equal income here, because should the income be negative, should the budget be negative or a positive, will they be should be spending money or should they be earning money? So I'll talk, tell you about all of these details later, but you can, in principle, define a market for mixed set of items. Okay? Okay. Uh, so what do we know for the chores? Goods extensively studied. Okay, for more than since we started within AGT field, uh, since 1990s, it has been extensively uh, studied. Um, but for chores, uh, not much is known, I would say. So, so Bogomolya, Mola, Sarmansky, and Yanowski, they, from the economics perspective, they started kind of understanding what equilibrium looked like and their structure and properties and so on. They considered the valuation function that are one homogeneous. So what is one homogeneous within concave? It's an important class where we say that it, it is one homogeneous. If you multiply a bundle with, say, a scalar A, then the value only gets multiplied with that scalar. That's called one homogeneous. It encompasses important classes like linear, CES, and so on. CES stands for constant elasticity of substitution. It's an important class within economics. Okay? If you don't know about it, don't worry about it. But it's kind of a P norm where P is less than equals 1, basically. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so for this, they gave the complete characterization of the competitive equilibria. And what they observed was that in the case of goods, when you have one homogeneous market, we know that the set of equilibria is going to be convex. Here, even with a linear valuation function, the set of equilibria can be non-convex, disconnected. Okay. Uh, even if you have only bads. So they were looking at mixed market, but even if you have only bads, uh, the set of clear are going to be non-convex. And this they thought maybe, they, I think they were also trying to get an algorithm, but not, I mean, a uh, uh, polynomial time algorithm, but they were not seeing the way to do it, and so probably they quote this, that we probably the problem is computationally hard. Uh, when you have many agents or items. And indeed, when the number of agents or items is a constant, we have polynomial time algorithm. Uh, Simina has worked on it. And then there was a follow-up work by Gerg and McLaughlin. Um, so the question we were wondering was, if we don't assume the constant number of agents or items, then what's the complexity? And we were not making any progress, so we thought, okay, how about approximation? Let's start with approximation. Okay? So <clears throat> that's where uh, we got some results. We got an FP task, which we call exterior point method. I want to tell you about this method, which is kind of a different type of continuous optimization method. And we start with linear valuations, but we could extend it to one homogeneous and also to mixed manner. Uh, so I want to basically kind of tell you about this algorithmic technique. And on the complexity side, we haven't resolved the complexity of CEI, okay? But in more general exchange model, the problem turns out to be PPID hard, which is, again, in contrast to 
to the goods case, there are strongly polynomial time algorithm with linear exchange model for the goods case. So that was again a surprise, a bit surprising result for us. Okay. So I will start with the first one. If I have some time, I'll talk about this, but I will show you a table of this where there are some really interesting open problems. Okay. Okay, so let me start. So again, the setting was you have a set of agents. Each agent, I'm just going to focus on only chose to start with and tell you what happens with the mix later. Every agent has an earning requirement of $1. And the items are divisible, the chores are divisible, and there is a one, sub, one supply for every chore available. And the valuation function is linear, but now it's a disutility. Remember, these, these are chores, they get negative utility. So to, to, I don't want to keep track of negative numbers, so I'm going to go think of them as positive disutility. And dij is just the mod of the, the positive absolute value of the vij. Okay, and now on I'm going to focus on the disutility function, and that way I'll be also able to contrast with goods case. Okay, so whenever I say VIX, I will mean the goods. Whenever I say DIX, uh, I mean the chores. Okay, D for disutility, V for value. Okay, so what is mathematically competitive equilibrium mean? Well, you want to find a set prices for each item. There are M items, M chores, P1 through PM. This is a per unit price such that when the agent looks at these prices and says, okay, I have to earn $1, so I have to demand a bundle such that price times the bundle, so P, PI summation PI XI, right? If PI is the price per unit of chore done and you do XI amount of chore, you get PI time XI paid. Sum over all the payments, you should be earning $1. Subject to that, you have to minimize the disutility. Okay? If you do that, what do you think the chores you will be doing? Intuitively, suppose I tell you that if you do this chore, you get $10. If you do this chore, you get $5. For the first chore, you have the utility of, let's say, 1, uh, or disutility of, say, 1. For the second chore, if you have a disutility of 0.25, you will try to do the chore that gives you minimum disutility per dollar earned. Right? You want to cut, you want to take as less disutility as possible while earning as much as possible, right? So you will try to consume the ones that gives you minimum disutility per dollar earned, okay? So you will only consume the minimum, minimum pain per buck, if you wish, that those chores, right? And finally, when everybody decides their consumption, demand should be equal to supply for every chore. Okay, so now on, I'm going to enforce demand equal supply and I'm just going to call those allocations feasible allocations. Because now I'm going, going, I'm for, I'm going to forget about the competitive equilibrium and going to only focus on the mathematics, okay? So now I'm going to only restrict myself to the, all the allocations where demand equals supply. Now the question is whether they are really buying their optimal bundle or disutility minimizing bundle, that's, a, that's I have to ensure. So this BMSY, the, their characterization was this. Focus on feasible X and minimize the product of the disutility. Now there is a catch here. Can somebody tell me what's the catch? I'm doing something really, really wrong by minimizing product of disutilities. Yes. You don't have to sign. I can pick one agent not assign anything to that agent, the disability is going to be zero for that agent, the product is going to be zero. So what am I doing? Well, they say, open constraint, that you have to avoid the zeros. You have to assign something to everybody. And everybody gets, should get some disutility. Okay? So that's the catch. Uh, <clears throat> fine. Um, I don't like to look at the product, so I'm going to apply log function and make it some of the logs. Okay. Now, okay. I wished I had brought the pen, but if you now look at this program, 
forget about like how hard this problem program is and so on. Just look at the first order KKT -K -K condition. Look at this, this is your constraint, x being feasible. For the jth item, let us say pj is the dual variable, okay, and take the derivative of the objective. You will get 1 over di xi and in the numerator you will get a dij there, okay. When you shuffle out, you will see you will get that bank per buck condition, dij over pj, and you will have xij non-zero only where the dij over pj is minimum. Okay, and that's how you get that this, this program, if each of the dixi is non-zero at the KKT point, then it gives you an, a, the competitive equilibrium that you are after. Okay, I'm, 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 this is very intuitive way of explaining why this program makes sense for computer equilibrium. I, didn't, I don't want to go into details and the analysis, but if you want to do a quick calculation in your head, then the dual, dual variable for this feasibility constraint will give you the price basically. That's the idea. Okay. Okay, how does this contrast with the case of goods? It's exactly the same program except instead of minimizing, you're going to be maximizing. For maximization, this is a very nice program because you, this is sum of the log of the linear, log is a concave function, sum is a concave function, you're maximizing a concave function, there'll be a global optima, everything is nice, and this is the eisenberg gill convex program, which also shows that at equilibrium, you maximize the product of the values, okay? Everything is very nice. With chores, you are minimizing a concave function subject to open constraint, okay? But you are only after local optima, only want a KKT point, not the global optima. Actually, global optima are the ones that you really have to avoid, okay? The global optima is where you, this product is zero, but that you have to absolutely avoid, okay? And so you, are, you want a kind of a, point on this lower hull of the distributed space, and there are these really nice global optima, where one of the DIs are zero, but you have to avoid them. Those are not your solutions. All other local optima are your solutions. By local optima, whenever I say local optima, it should not be thought of as, let's say, approximately. So you should, around that point, there should be a ball such that you can't increase the objective, or decrease the objective in the feasible region in that ball. Okay, geometrically what we are after, so it's a non-convex program, an open constraint, but we are after local optima. Geometrically, let me tell you what we are doing because that will be useful for the algorithm. Geometrically, we want, what is a local optima? Well, this is a local optima. If you look at the supporting hyperplane, it's normal. The normal should be proportional to the gradient at that point, gradient of the objective. What is the gradient of the objective? One over di. Ith coordinate is one over di. Okay, if the normal is proportional to the gradient, you are at the KKT point or the local optima. And this gives you the competitive equilibrium that you are after. <coughs> well, we will be only talking about approximate KKT point. What does that mean? The gradient is almost like, the, the normal is almost like a gradient up to error of one plus minus epsilon multiplicative error. And the only difference it makes in the competitive equilibrium is that it will have all the conditions except the agent's earning will be around one. It will be one plus minus epsilon. They will be buying their optimal bundle. They will be only buying their minimum pain per buck bundle items and so on. But they might not be earning exactly one dollar. They might be earning one plus minus epsilon. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> well, if you want epsilon KKD point, no matter what the program is, Apply gradient descent, simple. Okay, what's the big deal, right? Well, the problem is with this open constraint that you can't let any of the di coordinate to zero. So what happens when you apply gradient descent to this objective? Well, the, the gradient where you will improve the objective is minus one over di for the ith coordinate. So which, what is going to happen when you apply, you move in the direction of the gradient? Well, look at the minimum coordinate di. One over di will be maximum and that coordinate will decrease the fastest. So the minimum coordinate will decrease the fastest 
as you move in the side in the direction of the gradient. Okay, and <coughs> we never thought like initial approach you would try, right? Uh, would be kind of doing something from the interior, right? And what would you do? Well, you move in the direction of gradient, some some direction, the like positive direction of the gradient, right? That's what you will try to move. And no matter what we did, we always hit that bad, the ones that we want to avoid, these bad, bad solutions, okay? Now the problem is basically we are trying to minimize the sum log objective. That's, and that's, it doesn't know that you're trying to avoid this, right? They're, it thinks that, okay, the minimum is, the, these are the global minima, that's where you should be going. <coughs> So then we flip the problem around and said, okay, this objective is for maximization, not minimization. But if you want to do maximization, you should be going out of the feasible space. So you have to go in the exterior space. And the exterior space we define is to be the below the lower hull of this. Uh, so if this is your feasible disutility points, then it below the lower hull in the positive orthodontics are my exterior set. Okay, and there now, if you maximize and find a lo local maximizer there, it will be coincide, the KT point wise, it will coincide in the condition that the normal to the supporting hyperplane is proportional to the gradient and you will be fine. Does this make sense? So from the inside, we are trying to minimize the objective from the outside, but we were only after local optima, the KKT point. Instead, I'm going to look at this non-convex exterior point, exterior region, and going to maximize the objective. But still, I say that this, I'm going to still look after, look for this condition, and then that will suffice that the normal to the supporting hyperplane is proportional to the gradient, okay? Okay, so now um, when I try to maximize it, I will increase the smallest, co smallest coordinate fastest. So if DI is the smallest one over DI is the largest and that will increase the fastest. That's where, that's a good progress. That's what we should be doing. And so this was the main idea, but then we face with all of this non-convex region and how do you uh, well define only in the disutility space, not the allocation space. Disutility space doesn't have an explicit representation uh, if you try to do it explicit, then you have exponentially many constraints and so on. So, so we have to face, I mean, issue, uh, handle all of these issues. And so basically, this is the method. What we say is that start with any exterior point, I don't care. Project on the feasible space of disutilities, not, not the allocation, the disutility space. So the entire method always works with the disutility space. It has to maintain uh, witness whether you are feasible or infeasible in the allocation space, that it will do, but it will always work in the disutility space. Okay, so you start with a feasible, dis, uh, infeasible disutility point, project on the feasible disutility space. I claim that the projection is coordinate wise better than the, where you started with. And we prove this using the fact that from this point E, no matter in which positive direction I move to, I have to hit the lower hull, okay? So this direction where I hit the nearest point has to be one that increases every coordinate or at least doesn't decrease any coordinate. This at least ensures that my objective value has only improved. It hasn't gone down. Next, I look at the supporting hyperplane, okay? And still suppose the normal is not proportional to the gradient then I just do the most obvious thing, maximize the objective. When you maximize the objective on the supporting hyperplane, the next point has to be another exterior point, right? Because it was a supporting hyperplane, that's why, right? You mean the intersection of the supporting hyperplane is going to be non-empty because the exterior region is everything in the positive orthon below the lower hull. This cannot go negative, right? The objective is such that it will push it, push you away from zero. Okay. <clears throat> and 
because I maximize the objective, I must have improved the objective from when I go from D to E prime. Okay. And that is it. Yeah, you, you start with another one exterior point, you go to another exterior point. Da, 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 da. Okay. I am just going to repeat these two steps. So the algorithm is very simple actually. Okay. Uh, the question is why should, I mean this is what I will keep doing until I find a hyperplane whose normal is proportional to the gradient. So when I find a hyperplane with normal proportional to the gradient at that point, I stop. But why should I, why should this algorithm stop? Why can't it be that the potential increase in every step is so tiny that you will never hit this point where, where normal is proportional to the gradient? And that is where, that is the main actually lemma that we prove that either you are already at approximate KKD point or you improve the objective by at least a little bit. And again, you are going to use in this lemma, we are going to use the fact that if my normal is not proportional to the gradient, then it is making some nice positive angle with the gradient. And if I move on the supporting hyperplane, I will be moving in a positive angle with the gradient and that should improve the objective. Okay? And it is not exact like I am off by more than 1 plus epsilon in terms of the uh, KKT point. Right? So, it is not actually aligned with the gradient. It is not like within 1 plus epsilon plus minus epsilon error also it is not aligned. So, it is kind of making a quite a good an angle with the gradient. Okay? And that is the main idea. So, when I am at D, okay, I am at the feasible space of allocation and uh, what I can make sure intuitively in the market sense what is happening is that agents are consuming their minimum pain per buck items, but their budgets are not aligned. They might be off by more than 1 plus minus epsilon when your normal is not aligning with the gradient. So, when you maximize the objective at E prime, they will start buying, earning exactly $1. And that balances out the utilities, this utilities. Okay? So, if you were earning $10, if I am earning $5, then our disutility, even if they are same function, they will be off by two factor. But if we both come to 7.5, 7.5 earning, then our disutility is going to be aligned. That is the main idea. Okay? And so, that is that is intuitively how we prove it. When we go from linear to homogeneous, it was a nightmare, actually technical nightmare basically, because now function is not given explicitly. We have oracle access. Everything has to be done through uh, the ellipsoid type of argument. You incur error in every step. Your supporting hyperplane is wrong. Your normals are wrong. Everything is wrong by, off by something. Uh, but we make sure that the errors don't accumulate. Finally, we get the result. And if you are interested, I can tell you what happens with the mixed manner. It's a very curious thing that happens. But let me just go to the complexity part because maybe many of the people here might be interested in the qu questions on the complexity. Um, so for complexity, let me also introduce this exchange model. It is not. It is basically barter system. So you have some chores that you want to get done. You uh, and you have to, to, to pay for those, those chores, you have to earn money, so you are happy to do some other chores. That is what we do all the time, right? I teach, that is a chore, <laughs> so that I can earn money and maybe get some of my other chores done, like babysitting. <laughs> <coughs> Happens all the time. Well, what do we know? This is what we know. Okay. Uh, goods, we almost know what happens here. Many of you have worked. In this audience, many of you have worked on this. For chores, we get FP tasks for linear and CES both. Exact, the problem is, is what we can show is PPAD intersect PLS. So that's CLS now. Uh, we don't know the exact complexity. Okay. Uh, for linear exchange, the problem is PPAD hard with a caveat that you allow some distributive values to be infinity. That means you allow some agents to say that I have no skills to do this job. Like I can say that I have no skills, skills to teach 
music or painting something like that okay um so then the problem becomes really hard and uh, uh, even existence showing once you allow that some agents cannot do some chore. This is very easy to say in the goods case. I don't like this item, my utility for this item is zero. But there you have free disposal, so that helps. But here when you say that you can't do this chore, you really cannot assign this chore to this agent. And then even existence becomes tricky and uh, checking is NP hard, even constant approximation and so on. The problem is with undefined optimal bundle. So, you can do some set of chores, you want to get some set of chores done. Suppose the prices are such that the ones that you want to get done has positive price, that means you have to earn. But the ones that you can do have zero price, that means you can't earn. So what's your optimal bundle? It's infeasible, right? So that's the main issue and we kind of go around it by defining complex space of feasible prices. Uh, but apart from the open question that I mentioned in the table, to me, these are other open questions. What is the exact complexity of CI? Of course, can we do some second order method? Or is it really CLS hard? Or maybe in some subclass hard? What about Highland Jacobser? Of course, it will be PPAD hard. But maybe in some special cases, can we do it? Or I don't know, Highland Jacobser, uh, like in special case, do, we, do people have studied them in the special cases? And uh, do we know anything positive? Yeah, goods case, that's what I'm asking. And uh, dynamics, tragic analysis, and other applications to fair division, and those of you who are working on fair division, EF1 plus PO. Goods case, EF1 plus PO. <laughs> Nobody likes chores. <laughs> uh, the algorithm is through market equilibrium algorithm. Uh, so can we do EF1 plus PO here through market equilibrium algorithm as well? Okay, let me just stop. Thank you. Yes. So in chore, you don't want to do the chore unless I pay you. Yeah, but the, I don't want to pay you for, for, for good unless you give it to me. So a good has yeah. A yeah, you have value for good and you're happy. Cost and value. Yeah. Chore has cost and value. Correct. What's the difference? That's the surprise. Hmm? That is why mathematically how it change, turns out, these two problems turn out to be different. That's a surprise. I mean, intuitively, fundamentally, it's the same thing that for chores. What, what does it become different? That's what I'm missing. How does it become different? Uh, what to do with the notion of the mash thing that you mentioned? Yeah. So when you try to find an equilibrium for goods, you're going to be maximizing the product of the utilities. Uh -huh. But in the chores case, you have to minimize the product of the utilities. But if you try to minimize the product of the utilities, there is always a trivial solution where you don't give anything to one person, right? So mathematically, when you flip it around, it changes. That's a very good question, though, because that was my first question when I look at, when I saw this problem. What's, this, what's the difference? Yes. Yeah, we have code, uh, but we and uh, it's very fast. But on randomly generated instances, yes, right. we don't have any actual market data. Yeah. Okay. But, but yeah, if you have, and I'm really more than happy to. Yeah. Does it ever make sense to study a model where rather than everyone has to make one dollar in a day, everyone can only handle a certain amount of disposability? And then.
That is a good question. What we have to think about what do you mean by an, an equilibrium here? So everybody, so the constraint is not on the budget, but on the amount of this utility you can handle. Subject to that, you want to maximize your earning? Yeah, one could try and think about that. I don't know if, sorry? If nobody's able to incur enough this utility. Yeah, so demand equals supply is a question. You have to have at least the utility value which allows some feasible point. Yes. So you should not run into infeasibility. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I had a question. Yeah. Sure, 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 sure. No, go ahead. Correct. But typically in Eisenberg Gale with linear utilities, you, your approximation will be so good that you will hit the rational point, right? Like you sure that now you can round it to the rational point, right? In, in the linear case, I'm saying, where we know that there is a rational solution. That's what we were asking here. The approximation is not exponentially good. It's polynomially good, right? So the, the, the complexity question I'm asking is, say, let's say epsilon is 1 over 2 to the n. Now can you do it in polynomial time? So you have to do in log 1 over epsilon time. Can you do log in log 1 over epsilon time? I don't know. Okay. Maybe second order method, that's why I said, maybe second order method. Um, for P, uh, SPLC, uh, for, for exchange, uh, that's a ruled out thing. For exchange, it's PPAD hard even for 1 over poly n approximation. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's an honor to be invited here. Um, I have not collaborated with Mihalis, uh, but there is one area in which our works have in, uh, uh, overlapped, and that's this area of approximability, where I spent a fair amount of time in the 90s, and I thought it would be a good, a good time for us to be sort of reminded of all the things that were done over the years. This, uh, unlike other talks, which I've really enjoyed very much over here, uh, uh, there will be no proofs in this talk. This is just going to be a, re, you know, a retelling of history and, and uh, some, uh, maybe some pause to sort of uh, inspect one moment in this life. Uh, I sort of decided that, you know, there's, there's lots and lots of years that we're thinking about, really 50 years approximately. I thought I should at least sort of uh, I tried to come up with a nice number, but you know, 50 was the nearest number, but uh, since it's approximations, I thought it was sort of legitimate to use that number. So, but 50 years is a long time, and I tried to break the phases down into some phases, and I want to, in particular, sort of highlight this phase two, which is one of the, a, <clears throat> you know, sort of major transition points for our uh, thing. I would really say that, you know, we went from almost complete darkness to complete awareness now, and I'll try to sort of walk you through the phases and tell you about the story. And since it's a story and we do want to end at uh, roughly around lunchtime, uh, I'll be, you know, going over things moderately fast, but feel free to interrupt me at any stage and ask me questions. I'm more than happy to entertain those. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> way back when, uh, just after NP completeness had been invented and so on, 
I would say that we were in this phase which was you know at best sort of you know is that really dark is there some cloud that we are seeing there we did not really know and we were just I do not know whether you call it awareness or lack of it, but this was the space you could you know the experts sort of realize that oh, there is some notion called approximability and it is not trivial and it is something that is important we should look at it. On the other hand most of the community would say you know what is approximation probably more people knew about approximate counting in these days than about actual approximation of optimization problems. And you know the first question well, okay I have an approximation hardness result wise is not the end of the story. So um, that being said very early on the experts actually did have managed to get some amount of agreement on what is it that we should be seeking. Uh, this is amongst the experts not the people who are sort of yet thinking about approximate counting and approximation and as roughly solving the same things. It was clear that we should be looking at some class of non-negative functions and since we are looking at non-negative functions the right measure of approximation should be like the multiplicative notion we do not want to be confused by additive approximations. And uh, we should be thinking mostly you know both about maximization problems and minimization problems and uh, so all this was fixed actually one thing that was not very well fixed I am saying alpha inverse times this and alpha times that. But I do not necessarily mean that one of these is less than the other in fact the raging debate was when you talk about the approximability of a problem should you have you know decide to work with alpha less than or equal to 1 and alpha approximation you know do you want a 50 percent approximation to the traveling salesman problem or a, you know 200 percent approximation to the traveling salesman problem and we never could really agree on this. So in this class uh, lecture we will be working with this hyperbolic space where alpha is equal to alpha inverse. So you know I might say this is a half approximation and a two approximation the same breadth and of course this is a tautology right it is not it is not uh, a contradiction. So the first in approximability result which would have said you know there is nothing here to see NP complete problems are just hard to approximate was this one probably. I am not attributing it to anyone they just said oh let us look at traveling salesman problem with no triangle inequality. So all edges are weighted 0 and non edges are weighted 1 and you are not allowed to visit any city twice. So we want a cycle not a tour I mean this is kind of a meaningless problem and this was the starting point of approximability it could have been the end but thankfully it was not. By the way Levin also has a joke problem that he likes to talk about I have a function which takes m sat formulae as inputs and I want to approximate the number of these that can be satisfiable okay. And you know there is really no reason to be considering it seriously though I do not know whether Levin really meant it as a joke or not I mean, you know, the, uh, he did not smile when he said this but he would say oh I have this problem I know it is hard to approximate that is the end of the story let us move on. That was not the end of the story very soon we realized that that lots of very interesting questions that could be asked and could be answered and these are very um, insightful. So for example the metric traveling salesman problem has a two approximation by doubling a spanning tree um, satisfiability you can sort of take the all zeros assignment or the all ones assignment and one of these will satisfy half the constraints etc etc and they were you know these were easy stuff but at the same time they were important and I think one of the reasons these are important is because of this highlighted inequalities this um, mathematically this area was interesting because it brought inequalities into the space of combinatorial optimization you want to prove I mean how do you prove that you have a reasonably good traveling salesman tour when you do not know what the optimal tour looks like. So you need to have some inequalities where one side is polynomial time computable the other side is an NP hard quantity and you want to relate the two. So inequalities of course enrich in any space and uh, approximation thereby enriched the study of combinatorial optimization and that was already something that we could see at this stage. The awareness was increasing uh, in particular people started realizing that you know reductions are the source of problems and p-complete problems are equivalent under reductions when you are talking about exact computation or the decision problems. But as soon as you start doing approximations well you know some function may be approximable to within constant factors but look at n minus the function or even f the function minus 10 
it may suddenly not be approximable anymore. So, lots of very, very simple operations uh, completely skew the, 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 uh, the nature of the problem. So, reductions are something that we have to be very careful of, we should be aware of. And we also started identifying some milestones saying that look actually it would be very nice to come up with approximations which are arbitrarily good. By the way, I would like to propose that from now on we start calling these concepts estimations. You know, you get better and better and better estimations as you are going along to a particular quantity that you are interested in. Approximations, you know, 100 percent approximation, 50 percent approximation, 200 percent approximation, all of these are, you know, <clears throat> approximations, but if you are getting trying to get closer and closer and closer to the right quantity, maybe something interesting. This is what used to be called a polynomial time approximation scheme and uh, this would be nice for a problem to have almost sort of makes the NP completeness associated with this quantity um, an irrelevant notion, not maybe irrelevant, but at least much less impactful in practice if you could get polynomial time approximation schemes. When that is not possible, maybe get a, get a constant approximation, maybe log approximation, etc., etc. And then there was increasing sophistication in various uh, cases. Christophides' algorithm, which for the longest of times stood as the you know best algorithm in the space, was a three half approximation for the traveling salesman problem, improving upon the two approximation in the past, but uh, with some fairly sophisticated techniques. And uh, there was coloring was a problem that actually people looked at a lot. Gary and Johnson had this amazing paper, I was just looking at it to, uh, recently um, uh, in preparation for this talk and I realized that I do not know how to prove this and I looked at this proof and it is quite uh, 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 <clears throat> nice. I mean if I had to give it as an exam in an advanced course in algorithms or complexity, I am not sure how many students will be able to you know even with the hints work it out to the end. So, they showed that actually 2 approximation or 2 minus epsilon approximation of the chromatic number of a graph was NP complete. Okay. The trivial thing would be oh 3 coloring versus 4 coloring is hard, so 4 thirds approximation is hard, but this was better. Wigdeson's trick got invented in the space, this is the only result in our field that I know of that is referred to as a trick and it is I think I think Avi now has a license on the word trick, so nobody else can actually use it. But it is a beautiful algorithm, it uses some sort of Ramsey theoretic thinking in order to come up with this algorithm, but then it is a very simple one. Um, my advisor Ramesh Vazirani, this is one of the first talks that I remember seeing in the space of you know I was at a fox or a stock where this result was presented, this was one of the results that I saw, did not know what approximations were, this is where I learned what it was, showed us why chromatic number should be either very nicely approximable, sub logarithmic or very poorly super poly, I mean near polynomial can't be in between. Okay, very strange result and so on. So, graph coloring was definitely something that people realized oh this is something that is very interesting and approximations over here should be something worth studying. Loas had this famous set cover approximation people started and that was probably the one of the first places where we started thinking about linear programming and so on. Uh, relaxations of problems. So, so, there was like a lot of increased sophistication and still I would say that look at this stage we had you know maybe like you know there was this landscape we were trying to understand what we managed to find were a few sort of spots of clarity, but in general they are all sporadic, they are not getting connected and so on. What happened next and this is the phase that I want us to all sort of celebrate today is sort of a new hope. There was some way my PowerPoint skills are terrible. I wish I had a better animation for this part. I mean, something which really started to draw a web maybe in the space. Yeah, like the Star Wars set of three or <laughs> I know, yeah, it's, uh, that's like, like the second. This does, I did take the, this name from that in, uh, uh, thing, but it was not, I could not continue it into other stories. So, unfortunately. Um, so, what happened over here was this brilliant paper by Christos and Mihalis. Uh, talking about optimization, approximation and complexity classes. So, this was a single thread which said suddenly I do not know which problem to focus on, is this interesting, is this not interesting, why, why should I do this? They said look we can actually stitch together a whole collection of problems and even give you one or two to actually take home. Like 3 sat was a problem to take home for NP completeness, then here is a problem that we are going to see. 
So, what was this class? This was derived by uh, looking at the class um, SNP, which in came in turn came from uh, Fagan's uh, brilliant work in this area uh, that Moshe also mentioned yesterday. So, S over here stands for strict. I had to actually go back and look at the paper to find out what this S stand for because I we'd all forgotten. Um, so, it turns out that every language in NP can be sort of captured by a logical formula which more or less captures it exactly. I think this is what it means, but I you know do not take my word for it. And uh, strict NP is when you know in general for NP all languages in NP if you want to get exact capture uh, ring then you have to go through the sequence of quantifiers. S is a structure, X and Y are quantifying over single variables. Um, if you are not allowed this existential quantifier over the variables then you get a somewhat stricter class and that looks really like does there exist an x such that for all x psi of something holds. So, does there exist an assignment to a graph such that for all edges something holds ok. And if you decide to replace that existential uh, sorry the universal quantifier over x with a, a summation and now maximize over the s's then you get the maximization classes. So, it was very simple, natural, beautiful and suddenly we have a rich collection of optimization problems and now you can start talking about how are these related to each other. Now, um, <coughs> Papa Dimitri and Yanakakis did this very interesting thing which you know I mean if you are coming from maybe the space of logic you would not allow this next thing. But maybe you know in their case I mean they really wanted to talk about minimization problems at the same time as maximization problems and there is no minimization problems that sits like this. So, you have to do something what do you do you just say ok I am going to take all of these problems and close them under reductions. Now, when you work with reductions in approximations we know you have to be careful and so they had to come up with a definition. This was not the first definition that could have worked in the context of approximability, but this was possibly the first definition that sort of focused on the question of we want to talk about whether there are polynomial time approximation schemes or not. So, this is not the full definition of the reduction this is capturing some elements. The main thing that they said was look this is should be a reduction which starts by looking at a problem you want to solve reduce it to a problem that you want to solve such that you when you take this instance and look at a potential solution that is given here you are able to map it back. And what you should be focusing on is how close to the optimum this one is to the op, uh, this solution is to the optimum one and make sure that this one is proportionately close. So, that as you are getting closer and closer and closer over here you are also getting closer here. So, this was the right way to look at the problem this is something that preserved uh, the membership in polynomial time approximation schemes or not. And so, once you put this together suddenly you can have lots of very interesting problems uh, that can be related with each other. So, by the way there was also um, this is kind of the uh, uh, this is a sort of um, Papa Dimitri and Yanakakis paper was some, sometime around 88 I think uh, Moshe's paper with Thomas Feder was some maybe around 92, but over this period we sort of started to learn that look actually there is a very interesting subclass of things in particular from uh, this later uh, from Federvardi we realize that there are these things called constraint satisfaction problems which are sitting very naturally in uh, 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 SNP also. And these are problems where you I give you a template of constraints saying these are the kind of constraints that are allowed to use you are only allowed to use linear equations modulo 7 ok or whatever it is that you want to do. Maybe you are given quadratic equations over a field or something or the other whatever constraint I am allowing you, you use this to build constraint satisfaction problems. So, you apply these constraints which are always local constant locality to different tuples of your variables and then you ask the question find me an assignment which maximizes the number of things that are satisfied. These are probably the most central problems in so that, that, that sit naturally in Maxis and P and they are a very very rich class and you can spend a lot of time exploring them. And as we know these are also sort of very nice in that they can actually sort of allow dichotomies at times. So, you know very useful to study why not do the same thing with uh, the maximization problems. So, we, we can and we get these class called max CSP 
max CSPs I think have been sort of very interesting for us in various ways just the same way that CSPs have been interested in, in the context of broader NP. In the context of approximation uh, of optimization and approximation these have been very good benchmarks to look at. So, just wanted to take that aside to mention this if you know you know if you look at a problem saying I give you a graph color it with 5 colors. So, that the maximum number of edges are colored properly that is an example of a max CSP and there are lots and lots and lots of these around and already give you a good flavor for what <coughs> uh, max SNP looks like. So, back to this paper they said well ok we have this class we have the reductions now we can start finding complete problems and here is a host of them. I mean the first paper has this theorem I might not have listed everything, but you know maximum 3 sat maximum 3 sat on bounded degree instances. So, every variable only appears a bounded number of times and vertex cover in bounded degree graphs dominating set independent set are all max SNP complete max 2 sat max cut max die cut. I mean there are people who have spent lifetimes exploring any one of these problems and they were all coming together now. And it is not just the complete problems there are many hard problems and now so ok if these were not so exciting, but look you could just drop the boundedness consideration all that will change is that these problems are no longer in max SNP, but they are still hard because the previous instances were special cases. And so, you all these important questions that you were interested in studying they are all going to be harder the, um, and then there were follow up works in particular listing, listing a whole bunch in which Mihalis was involved metric traveling salesman problem the shortest super string problem. Uh, a multi terminal cut problem uh, all of these were shown in works by Mihalis to be um, max SNP hard. So, all of these are going to be you know if you want if you think any of these has polynomial time approximation schemes you have to show all of max SNP has polynomial time approximation schemes. And there was also this beautiful result by Avrim Blum here uh, which says that you know even very 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 weak approximations of the clique number were actually uh, max SNP hard. So, this is under some randomized reductions and star usually that means that in this uh, talk, but so lots of problems that were turning out to be hard for the class. So, what is the conclusion that you draw you have to focus on max 3 sat right. I mean this is the problem to be considering. This paper was also you know it is a gem in many many ways and <coughs> as usual you cannot go by one of these papers without uh, observing some very interesting quotes I did not pick all of them, but one of them that I really really appreciate and sort of became part of a um, you know it was a philosophy that had already been taught to me by Umesh Vazirani who was in turn you know um, you know with credit to Christos and Mihalis had told me that look you know complexity classes are our uh, metaphor these are how we think this is how you capture everything it is not just technical things that we use to prove theorems this is really our underlying philosophy. And there is this beautiful phrase, uh, phrase out here in complexity when we are faced with a situation in which a family of problems cannot be identified with known complexity classes one suspects that a new complexity class may be manifesting itself. And so, it is our goal to <coughs> identify isolate and study them. Um, so, this was I mean this is not the only paper where we have seen Christos and Mihal is doing this some wonderful papers that we have seen later on include you know things about limited non determinism where you study the complexity of the VC dimension uh, or local search problems we have heard about those and PP, PPAD and fixed P all of these are sort of complexity classes that are emerging by this kind of a vision. Max SNP is one more of these you know we should go out there study it and try to say what we can about it. A second class of quotes is what is about you know why they decided to do this define the complexity class and not just go ahead and prove hardness of approximation. They really had everything down I mean they say over here the difficulty in you know proving that these problems are NP hard lies in the fact that our main technique for showing negative approximability results uh, is you know we do not know how to create a gap in the cost function. And if you look at later results this is exactly what we were able to do and as soon as we were able to do it for the right problem then the whole space clarified itself. There is also this very mysterious quote there seems to be no notion of approximately correct computation. An easy quote to say I mean there is no notion of something yes which is true no notion of this thing. 
But it's a very carefully chosen phrase and I personally feel that it sort of affected me very, uh, <clears throat> it helped me a lot. All right, so we went from this uh, moment of just you know random few sporadic instances to some central theme over here which was starting to shed light and the somehow the situation was just ripe for us to be able to bounce forward. It required a lot of coincidences, things working out, the stars aligning and we were able to get a very, very good picture in the next few days due to uh, some very you know uh, remarkable results. So one of these was the result due to Feiger, Goldwasser, Lova, Safra and Segedi who proved us that proved to us that creek is hard to approximate. Let us say to constant factors I do not want to get into more uh, details there unless something quite unexpected would happen. So more or less morally approximating creek is NP hard okay. And this was should have been the you know we should have realized this was much 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 bigger than it is but it took us a little while I mean we are just barely coming to grasp with all these different problems that you could be working with. I remember being in this talk by uh, maybe uh, Feige I do not remember who it was that was giving this talk at Berkeley and Umesh went to this talk and said okay so what do you have to say about chromatic number I mean you know so it is as if you just solve one problem what else you know but what about the others. So it, we were still learning about approximations in those days. It was not completely clear what one thing could mean. And then there was this uh, work of Aurora and Safra and then a work with Aurora, Lund, Motwani and Segedi where we were able to show that actually Maxis and Pihard problems uh, do not have PTASs. So the problem that uh, Christos and Mihalis had highlighted and so now we can just pull in from this entire literature that has been building up and say all of these questions at least have a partial resolution, a coarse resolution. Uh, this was, oh right, unless NP equals P, right, sorry, good. <laughs> uh, everything I could say, I am saying could be false, very good. <laughs> Somebody is paying attention. <laughs> um, so what is PCP? In retrospect PCP was just one more of these max CSPs okay. For some family of functions you could pick any family of functions and if you can just say that there is a reduction to that thing then we would have had a PCP theorem or that would have been equivalent to a PCP theorem. What is the PCP theorem? It just says there is a reduction from 3 sat to this max CSP problem if which will map satisfiable instances to satisfiable ones and unsatisfiable ones to ones with a gap. So this is exactly the gap that we were seeking before and we have it and modulo the fact that we arrived at this theorem by thinking about provers and verifiers and active objects this is all it is. I mean it is just a different language for expressing exactly the same uh, thing. So this was really what uh, turned, the, um, turned the tide and by, just by the way I mean for me personally uh, Soda 92 was a very significant moment. Uh, Mihalis was there giving a talk on a three quarter approximation algorithm for approximating MaxSat and while I was sort of uh, <clears throat> wandering off mentally in this talk I suddenly realized this thing that oh there is there is a notion of approximately correct computation that seems to be evolving. There were papers by Babai Fortno and Lund, Babai Fortno Levin and Segedi and that seems to be exactly what uh, is needed over here. So I went and talked to Mihalis after the talk and I said oh Mihalis uh, what do you think and Mihalis said uh, you know you should talk to Mario. So he, that brought you know Mario and uh, Mario Segedi and Karsten Lund who were at Bell Labs with uh, Mihalis had also already been working on this problem uh, <clears throat> with Aurora and uh, Motwani we had been thinking about this also from some different point of view and now the two teams brought were brought together and so we sort of built on each other's work and uh, got some very nice results together. So that is how this uh, thing happened. So thank you Mihalis for that uh, uh, inspirational moment. So beyond Maxis NP what could you do? So PCP theorem is very, very powerful is able to resolve a lot of questions. Can you do anything more? Clique we already know from this result of uh, Blum and this by the way we understood 
better in the language of PCPs that yes we should have been able to get an end to the epsilon hardness and there was no need for randomization in the reductions because we know how to get rid of some kinds of randomness. The most interesting problems that were left open at this stage were set cover and chromatic number. I mean LOAS's log n approximation algorithm, chromatic number you know uh, Lenial Vazirani, uh, Vigderson, we have Gary and Johnson all of these things are sitting around and all we could say about these are oh, yeah these are hard to approximate to with an arbitrarily good constant factors okay and at least that much we could say but that is the most we could say. So, what is the story over here? Everybody thought about this, but the result was resolved in a stunning paper by Karsten Lund and Yanakakis. I mean the PCP theorem was not a trivial result by any means and I am not uh, saying that, but all the work was done into building up to proving that theorem. And once we proved the theorem all the work that was done afterwards to establish different hardness of optimizations were all you know baby things that you should give in as exercises in your favorite complexity class. This paper is not of that genre do not do this unless you are most malicious, but set cover was not approximable any better than the uh, lowest uh, numbers up to constant factors and chromatic number was not into the little of one uh, things this should have really been two different papers is very little connecting them, but it was a brilliant pair of papers over here. Uh, one of the things that was noticed in these papers that I forgot to mention on these slides is that you know the most standard way of looking at the PCP theorem was saying max 3 sat is and hard to approximate to within some constant factors. That version would not have been sufficient to prove these theorems you really had to go back a couple of steps and look at some max CSP where all the constraints are binary, but are actually acting on very large uh, variables variables that are taking values in very large sets and that is what is called these two prover interactive proofs you really had to go back to those things and that is how you get the best results and that is how uh, these two results or at least maybe maybe both of these worked that way. So, it was a beautiful paper uh, by the way there was also a very uh, uh, sort of less noticed uh, uh, result by Lund and Yanakakis that actually gives an infinite family of problems which do not have p-tasses as a result of this. I think I am quoting that right am I not yeah okay great. So, I, I, as far as I could tell I could only see the first two pages of this paper for because of some copyright issues. So, all I could find out was it was not PTAS, but I do not know if there were stronger results that were proved in the paper actually. So, all kinds of results. So, suddenly the PCP theory is answering almost all the questions that we first asked in this thing. You put this together with the theory sitting around max S and P that is really like extremely powerful and compelling. And this was maybe sort of viewed by many of us that look at this is the end of it from now on we are going to prove more and more and more negative results and settle the whole space nothing is left to be done. That is not how it ended up being the first surprise was the semi definite programming based uh, optimization algorithm of uh, Gummins and Williamson. I am mentioning the max cut thing because I remember the approximation ratio they also gave something for max 2 sat and they also had something for max sat. And they did extend also to max sat and for coloring and so on. So, this was a very powerful paradigm and by the way I mean in those eras if you were living in those times each one of these results was a major surprise. If you were a betting person you would have lost a lot of money betting on this space because everything that you expected to be true was not. So, here was this thing and it said look you know um, the PCP theorem has just come along. So, maybe you know Mihalis's paper on max sat is the last word on it, but it was not and this was one such thing. Another direction of surprise that sort of enriched the space of algorithm significantly was the discovery of the notion of metric embeddings. There were lots and lots and lots of papers over here including the one that you heard from uh, Vijay on, uh, on the on day one I did not, but I think you must have heard about it Garg was Irani and Anakakis. Uh, all of these papers were just brilliant they were trying to show how you can embed one metric space into another and as a result get approximation algorithms out of it. This realization has also sort of uh, brought in a revolution into our field which is independent of the revolution in approximability. Finally, I mean all this being said the way 
uh, I mean, this is one of my own results with Sanjeev here and uh, Luca Trevisan and David Williamson, where we said that, look, at least these CSP problems, if you just look at those on Boolean variables, you can characterize all of them, and amongst all of them, there's just finitely many different ones. And so you do not have, you know, log n to the C approximation for every possible C. There are maybe two or three of these, maybe one, but that's it. And you have constant factor approximations. You have no problem over here, which has a polynomial time approximation scheme, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things, complete classifications can be done. So that's more or less justifying this picture that we had, uh, which I'll go to in two slides of, you know, a coarse understanding, a blurry understanding of everything. You can't look at a problem and say exactly how well it can be approximated. But you can pretty sort of coarsely say, oh, roughly where does it lie in terms of approximability for a very, very broad class, not everything. Okay. So a close across uh, understanding of, uh, across the spectrum. Also going back to this notion of reductions, did we use L reductions? Not really because by now we have these gapped problems. We can actually know how to build reductions from one gapped problem to another independent of what kind of separations were there between them. So you figure out what is it that you want and you just go for them and there are lots of tools available by now to build this gap in, create the gap, expand the gap, etc., etc. So we went back to gap reductions. So fortunately for us, a lot of the resulting remaining theory was built in terms of standard reductions, yes instances mapped to yes instances, no to no and no worries about uh, inverting the solution, etc., etc. But that being said, all the reductions that existed were extremely useful because they just allowed us to say one NP, you know, max SNP, you know, one NP hardness of a max SNP problem is now giving us everything else. So this was how things were, a very coarse understanding of everything. So you can see that things are kind of blurry, but not really in sharp focus. But there is something out there. We are able to understand the where the bright spots are, where the dark spots are, and presumably find some explanations for them. And uh, then we started seeing a few even more clear regions over here. And these basically went down to the Hostad revolution, I think. Uh, there were three brilliant papers by Hostad. Two of them talked about the clique uh, problem and showed uh, that it was a hard to approximate to within basically any non-trivial factor, you know, n to the 1 minus epsilon and an n vertex graph. I read that as an n approximation is hard. And also gave the optimal algorithm for maximum exact 3 sat, like every variable, every class has three distinct literals. You know, you pick a random assignment, it will satisfy 7 eighths of the things. So if you just look, count the number of classes and say 7 eighths of them, that's a good approximation algorithm and that's the best that you could do. And this is the revolution that sort of brought in analytic methods into our field and, you know, completely transformed the way many of us think. Before this thing, I mean, I think this is the end of my contributions to the space because till now I was sort of having a hey, nice time playing with finite fields and doing polynomials and so on. This was the end of this thing. From now on you have to do analysis of probability theory in order to do approximations. So uh, I was done. There were also some other results, for example, Laitai Michiancio showing that uh, <clears throat> shortest vector prob problem in lattices are hard to compute. There were many interesting progresses on uh, routing problems, including some work by uh, Sanjeev, who's here with uh, Julia Chuzai and Chandra and others. Um, <clears throat> and it was not all negative news. I mean, during this period, maybe starting from the PCP theorem down to now, we also started realizing that, you know, I mean, negative results, absence of a negative result is no longer just because an inability to prove a negative result. It may be actually a hint of a positive result that's out there. So this led to, for example, Aurora and Mitchell, sorry about the spelling there, uh, who showed, you know, traveling space salesman problem in Euclidean spaces actually had polynomial time approximation schemes. There was also a similar sort of beautiful result due to Chuzo and Lee who show that, you know, edge disjoint paths problem, which we were not able to show hardness results for, actually had a very nice positive uh, um, uh, result going with it and that's why uh, this works. So 
still there were many gaps there were some problems like vertex cover, max cut, max two side etc. All of these had this interesting feature that there were always about two variables at a time and we could not get a you know pin down the optimal thing that could happen. So, this is how we started um, the phase 5 we had a blurry image of the whole space and very sharp image of um, uh, some parts of the space due to Johan's results and what ended up at this end of thing is a conditional clarity and I think this picture is kind of appropriate this is in my opinion this is probably this is a picture from the James Webb telescope and sort of looking at some galaxies out there except I do not think this is a real picture because I mean the, 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 the signals that you are seeing are not in the human visible sp spectrum they are something assembled by some signal processing methods into this picture which is claimed to us is the correct picture of the world it may be all false or it may be all true which is exactly the state that we are in now we have an exact understanding of almost all of optimization under one conjecture and that conjecture may actually be false. So, that is this famous unique games conjecture of court um, unique games conjecture unique games is this problem where all constraints are basically linear equations modulo some prime for a large prime ok constant, but large prime. And the conjecture says it is very hard to distinguish instances which are almost satisfiable from instances which are almost unsatisfiable ok. And that is all the conjecture is a very very qualitative statement it does not say the only quantitative parts are this quantifiers for every epsilon there is a large enough prime for which this problem you know 1 minus epsilon versus epsilon is hard to separate ok. And uh, this conjecture quote came up with and then used it with Regev to show that for example, 2 minus epsilon approximation of vertex cover uh, is going to be hard NP hard ok. So, you know then look like the most stunning result at the time I looked at this paper and I said of course, you know if you let me make assumptions I will also prove theorems. But very soon after there was this very striking result due to Kurt Kindler, Mosel and O'Donnell which said that oh actually this conjecture also implies that the 0.878 algorithm for uh, max cut sorry that so max cut not SDP for max cut is the optimal one. Now, that is sort of that is a very precise number there are no precise numbers in this assumption. So, something qualitative is happening this unique games must be something very 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 interesting. And then Prasad put the sort of nailed this thing and this is why I have this picture of a very 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 clear uh, uh, picture of a galaxy every function uh, max CSP oops card I, I again max CSP on this function family f for every function family f there is one semi definite programming that we already have this comes from the semi sum of squares hierarchy uh, now. And uh, this is the optimal algorithm however, well it does is going to be the best we can do in polynomial time anything beyond this is not done. So, pretty much the entire spectrum laid out in front of us we know almost everything just assuming the unique games conjecture and so I will take a couple of more minutes and then I will be done. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, again raging debate is this conjecture true or false people were taking bets maybe uh, I think Boaz was sort of betting on both sides secretly on alternate days and so on. But you know um, there is a very rich theory of uh, sum of squares based algorithms and there is also some new uh, interest in the problem saying ok we have sort of looked at graph expansion for a long time, but now a new lens on it let us look at how small sets are expanding let us ignore the big sets. And these things all started tying up together there was a very rich theory emerging and finally, sort of it culminated in this brilliant theorem by Kurt Minzer and Safra which says that the 2 to 2 games conjecture this u stood for unique and instead of which would have been mapped to a 1 to 1 here that instead of that we got some other related 2 to 2. What is 2 to 2 roughly instead of having linear constraints modulo p you have quadratic constraints modulo p roughly on two variables at a time. So, you all your constraints look at two variables put in some quadratic constraint on them and say these constraints should all be satisfied. If that happens then they get exactly almost satisfiable instances are indistinguishable from unsatisfiable ones under 
uh, so these are uns, uh, indistinguishable assuming p is different from n p. So, we are very 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 close to proving the unique games conjecture or well I do not know that you can we can say that we are close, but at least my betting strategy has changed after this paper. Okay. So, I cannot be to totally sure what I would uh, do with this. So, the way I want to uh, describe the picture is from 1973 to 1923 we have sort of gone from complete darkness to a near total clarity about what the space of approximations look like and I think it is largely in part due to this uh, idea due to Christos and Mihalis of focusing on the right problem and getting us focused on the right problem. Um, the big remaining questions obviously if we want to settle the unique games conjecture even if we do we have to deal with satisfiable instances and Subhash probably talked about this uh, uh, in, in this series already. For instance we would love to resolve the hardness of 3 coloring is it really hard to you know color a 3 colorable graph with log n colors or something like that ok. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, no I, I mean I, I, I do not believe the theory is giving us an effective classification for max CSP. It is a weakish classification you can sort of say that look I want to ask the question are instances of value at least alpha separable from instances of value at most beta ok. And the answer will come back of in the following form well either that is this is these are actually in dis, uh, actually distinguishable or alpha minus epsilon and beta plus epsilon are actually impossible to distinguish. It could of course be both, but that we do not know and in order to answer this question we need a finite amount of time given a finite positive epsilon. So, uh, Prasad am I getting this right ok. So, this is the result due to Prasad then uh, this is how effective the classification is. It is a very I mean it is a it is a brilliant result you would sort of look at this and say look you know um, on the you know th th there was a real challenge in those days of saying look what are these hard instances for these semi definite programming in, uh, problems going to look like and let us sort of spend a lot of energy finding the hard instances and uh, explaining their structure and Prasad just decided to abandon this and said look if you give me an instance I will prove that the problem is hard if you do not give me an integrality gap instance it means the problem is easy and that is it. The only thing is there is a little bit of an epsilon loss and answering the question of whether this epsilon uh, uh, you know whether this integrality gap instance exists or not can be done in finite time, but it is sort of blurry up to this epsilon. But you did say the finite email you said I did not fully understand you said that the finite email bands of approximation. Right, finitely many bands of approximability when we consider bands to be loosely defined in the sense but any constant is like any other constant. If you take these bands, for these bands do we have effective classification? Yes, for these bands we have I mean we know exactly which problems are, but the one big catch is this is Boolean. So, this is like Schaefer, this is not like Bulletov and uh, so on ok. So, this is uh, so, so yeah. Thanks, Dimitri. Uh, good. So, yes, I mean, uh, we were thinking that finally you decided to skip uh, a talk, ok, you know, and I, th I thought that would be a great, I mean, listen, I mean, we love meetings, we love conference, we love, you know, you learn amazing things, you meet old friends, you interesting uh, new ideas. And of course, the secret uh, guilty pleasure of skipping talks. Okay? <laughs> so, you know, can you imagine, you know, Michael, you know so three days, can you visualize a conference 
three-day conference where you are not allowed to skip one talk. <laughs> you know, okay, you know, so, so this is, this is Mihaly's predicament. Really, if you take a walk, okay? You know, it, it, he, will, he will not. I mean, you know, he, he's worried what I'm going to say. <laughs> 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 so, so uh, uh, I think it's obvious to everybody that Michalis and I go back a long way, okay? So, um, uh, so it was uh, 50 years ago, essentially to the dot, okay? You know, uh, 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 at Princeton, and I met Michalis, okay? You know, so, um, uh, and, and, um, uh, He's a first year PhD student. I'm a third year PhD student about to leave. Um, and he's interested in communication theory, all right? I mean, and I, and I have just started doing work in uh, theory of computer science. So it is the famous uh, uh, Shannon-Turing debate, okay? You know, you know actually, it, it happened. I don't know how many of you know, but, but the, the two met and debated. Uh, and uh, uh, so, um, I tried to interest him in computer science, in theoretical computer science, and he resists. I mean, in the beginning, he seems to bite, and then he's, he always concluded this way, this can't be serious science, okay? You know, it, you know, you know it, it seemed to, he, to him too joyful and pleasurable. So, you know, to, 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 <laughs> yeah, not, not information theory, okay? You know, so um, uh, in any event, this goes on for a year, and then uh, I give up. Right, I mean, you know, and and uh, I go. I moved to Boston, and a couple of months later, he gives me a call, <laughs> and uh, he say, you know, it was, you know, we had, you know, he, he wanted to discuss a technical point about MP completeness. I said, Michalis, what are you doing? <laughs> he said, Well, I think I think I'm going to work in this stuff. Okay, so so I mean, we had we had our first in-depth technical discussion, and uh, I remember that uh, that. Uh, I felt after that, uh, suppose I quit science now. Suppose I go and work for that student I met, okay? You know, so um, uh, what, you know, I have done enough for computer science. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I recruited Yanakakis, okay? You know, that, that, <laughs> you know, I really felt that way at that moment, okay? You know, that, 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 that I have done something really important, okay? Uh, okay, so, um, we were, you know, for essentially a quarter of a century, we worked very close together, you know, in, 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 uh, in sync. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, we worked on the completeness, of course, okay, which was the big thing at the time. We worked on algorithms, uh, which is what you do if you cannot prove a problem and be complete, okay? And, uh, 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 we, uh, and then when NP was not enough for us anymore, we started, we started inventing new, com new, new complexity classes, okay, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and I, I, you know, I'm looking around the room and maybe three or four of you uh, remember this, uh, know about this, but we worked on other stuff also, okay, you know, <laughs> you know uh, we worked on, on the mathematical aspects of everything practically that was happening in computer science, okay, because at that time, theory, computer science theory, and, and Ullman, uh, Jeff Ullman, who is here, is sort of, you know, the, the, the exemplar of this. Uh, uh, theoreticians uh, were sort of uh, felt responsible to, uh, to attack the mathematical problems everywhere in computer science, okay? You know, so, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, 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 I mean, I remember, I mean, some in the late 70s, uh, a new technology of memory technology came up, which was called magnetic bubble memory. Okay, no, none of you remembers it. Okay, but but I mean it was a, it was what you, what you can imagine. So you know, and it had some interesting, you know, it had some difficulties. All right, I mean, you know, and I remember Michalis and I looking at each other and say, we say, were saying, "Shit, are you going to work on this now?" Okay, you know, you know, you know, you know it, there was no way out. I mean, you had, we had to. Uh, fortunately, it went away after a couple of years, and, 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 and we, didn't, we didn't have to. Right? So, um, so this was uh, uh, this is this is how this is how it was back then. Incidentally, uh, when I met Mihalis, at the same time I met his his uh, his uh, life's companion. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we, you know the, the first you know the second half of, of our first of my last year in college 
we used to have essentially every every uh, uh, every uh, uh, dinner together at at, uh, at the graduate college at Princeton, um, uh, and and uh, 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 soon I, I was in Boston, you know, and, and, and uh, Miharis and Maria Elena uh, got married. Uh, and at that time, we were working with Michalis on a problem in databases, okay? A paper that we wrote was called Algebraic Dependencies, okay? Something about uh, how to design database, databases. And um, uh, after, you know, it was soon after the wedding, and Michalis, uh, you know, had to finish the paper. He said, okay, I'll, I'll come to Boston. I was at MIT at that time, and we'll work on it. Uh, and I said, are you sure? So, so soon after your wedding, he said, you know, I'll come. So, so, uh, uh, and we worked very hard. We worked, you know, and one of the, the days, uh, you know, after we were exhausted, uh, we went to a Chinese restaurant that was the first, the, the, the only place that was open, okay, at, at that time. Uh, and we had a good meal. We kept talking about the problem, and they brought us, uh, they brought us the bill, and of course, what else? I mean, you know, and, and Chinese cookery. So, um, I read mine. It was one of the usual, usual cliches. I didn't pay any attention, and then I noticed that Michalis had an expressionless face. Okay, you know, so so I said, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, this is, you know, so what was your, what did, what did you say? <laughs> so I literally struggled it out of his, out of his hand. Okay, out, out of his fist. I, I did. Okay, so you know, I knew that there was something newsworthy there. Okay, so, and I'm not kidding you. This is what the damn thing was had written on it, okay? <laughs> I'm not <laughs> This is true, folks, okay? So, you know that, you know that? all right? <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, so, uh, so, uh, the, we invented a lot of classes, okay? So, so you know, uh, Madhu said a few things about uh, about a couple of them. Let me, let me, let me. You know, I had already a slide, so I'm going to tell you. I mean, you know, DP, okay? Sort of, you know, uh, uh, the number of the graphs that have click whose maximum click is offside exa exactly k, okay? You know, uh, that was that was a warm up, all right? I mean, so. Um, uh, we also sort of, you know, we proved the first natural problems in NEXP, okay? For example, I give you a, gra a circuit uh, representing a graph. Does this graph have a Hamilton cycle, okay? You know, problems like that. Um, uh, we, uh, we've, uh, with Dave Johnson, we've uh, had a complex characterization. I mean, you know, there are problems that, the enumeration problems that cannot be solved unless P calls MP. So, I mean, so that's... That's in some sense a class. We we uh, codified uh, complexity-wise local search again with, with David. Um, Max and SMP, uh, uh, Madhu told you a lot about this, and I'll uh, say a few things. Log NP is another class that Madhu mentioned, which is uh, 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 deterministic algorithms that have a limited amount log squared and determinism, non-determinism, okay? And if you do that, you can solve some problems. For example, uh, uh, given a graph, does it have a click of size n, okay? You know, or log n, sorry, all right? I mean, so that you can solve this in this class, okay? And it has complete problems, and it's sort of, you know, it has interesting complete problems, you know? And the point is, uh, that, you know, we also wanted to, you know, when you have a new class, uh, a new computational phenomenon, you want sort of, you know, to, to have a, a positive example, right? I mean, or that not all, problem, not all problems are, you know, some of them are in P, okay? So, and we were suspecting that uh, the problem of uh, given uh, graph does it have a vertex cover of, log n, of size log n. Uh, that that's in P, okay? So, you know, and we spent a day working on this, you know, and, and we could smell the algorithm, you know, we could smell the, you know, it's, it's not a difficult, you know, it's a paragraph proof, okay? It's one trick. Uh, we, we could, we, you know, we knew it was true, okay? So I was staying at his house, uh, and, and his family was away. Uh, and uh, then, then, then we went to sleep. Uh, the next morning I was uh, preparing breakfast. I asked him what he wants. He t told me, shut up, Christos. I saw the proof in my dream, okay? <laughs> so, so, you know, there, there, there are legends in chemistry, in, in neuroscience, about a chemist who won the Nobel Prize for a, an experiment 
that uh, he saw in his dream. Okay, so you know, but uh, I have not heard of a mathematician uh, having the proof, seeing a proof in his dream. Okay, you know, so mm -hmm. Michalis did. Okay, so um, good. Um, and uh, uh, years later, uh, we we came up each one of our own uh, different way of understanding fixed points, okay? You know, mine was combinatorial and approximate. His was, uh, again, approximate, but, but sort of uh, 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 in a different way. Uh, cool. Uh, but let me tell you a little more about Max SMP. Uh, so, uh, APX, by the way, is the way Madhu named it and uh, renamed it. I, I like I like this this much more. Um, so approximation, okay? What kind of class? What is the right class for this? I mean, and and to come back to a to a, to a, to a uh, mysterious uh, sentence that we had there. Here's what we, here's what we meant: that classes capture computation. And computation fails only catastrophically. Okay, the, you know there is, you know, and, and you know, in other words, how can you control the way that co computation fails? Right? I mean, so how, you know, there is nothing continuous or 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 uh, 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 approximate about 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 computational failure. And of course, if you think about it, uh, PCP is non is a non-continuous uh, sort of you know uh, incarnation of you know where it can fail in a in a, in a continuous way so in a brilliant uh, brilliant a very interesting way um, and and essentially uh, during these years i would go three or four times two or three or three times every year i would i would take the uh, the red eye from uh, from uh, uh, from sfo you know in the 80s to newark and uh, and uh, then uh, i would immediately go at eight o'clock to start working with Michalis. okay you know so so um, uh, uh, all the youth okay you know <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, and every time we would say Shall we work on this uh, approximation stuff? Okay, that we are getting nowhere, or should we so shall we do something else? Okay, so you know we had all, we had it all, always in our mind, and in the end, uh, it you know the uh, the uh, Max SAP, which sort of you know uh, borrowing from the logical uh, approach to computer science, which we had embraced. Okay, so you know. You know, this is this is not the most the most um, uh, popular approach in, in complexity, but we had always been fans of it. Okay, so uh, uh, and exponents uh, and uh, L reduction and complete. You know, people ask me why did you call it L reduction? Okay, you know, uh, can I be frank once? Uh, my secret hope that it would be called Papa Dimitri. It, it was su such a such an ugly name that it would be called as Papa Dimitri Yanakakis reduction. Okay, you know, <laughs> you know, but but it didn't work. All right, you know. all right so um, uh, uh, and three years later, sort of, you know, uh, when, you know, uh, that was a very successful definition because 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 it motivated uh, an amazing result. Uh, cool. Uh, by the way. Uh, uh, how many of you knew this? Okay, uh, Michalis and I had started looking very, very similar. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. So, and uh, you know, this is this is uh, 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 pictured by Martha. Okay, you know, so she and she unearthed it. Okay, so for for, for this occasion, um, and I mean, you know, if you are a handsome man like Michalis, this is very risky. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. So, uh, I mean, no, I, I will dissect the, the question that everybody's waiting, okay? How does Michalis brain, brain work, okay? I mean, no, so I, I gave you a few clues, okay? But, um, but let, let, me, let me actually focus on a slightly easier problem, okay? How, how does the brain work okay, in general, okay? Like, <laughs> so, so, so uh, um, I mean, no, uh, this is uh, is uh, uh, one of the of the 
most important province in science, frankly. Okay, you know, so this is this is my, uh, you know, his office is half a mile north of here, uh, and and uh, and uh, basically he says that uh, discerning this logic. I mean, he uses logic, okay, which means uh, sort of you know an ultimate computational formal system. Uh, as the most important future direction in, in neuroscience, right? I mean, so this is what I have been working the last 10 years uh, with uh, 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 a team of, of friends and, and you know, students and, and, and uh, 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 Sam Ferriduni is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, a, is a new member, is entering this, this, uh, this group, uh, this, uh, this research group. Um, and uh, here's our approach. Uh, we have defined, uh, you know, for many years now, uh, a mathematical model of the brain, which captures important aspects of neural activity. You know, and, and uh, uh, we fall, we we feel, you know, we, the hope was that it's going to capture enough important aspects of neural activity that we are going to simulate something very interesting. Okay, you know, and, and uh, frankly, we have some succeeded. Uh, that it obeys the basic tenets of neuroscience. For example, there is no back propagation. Okay, if you, if you are interested. Okay, uh, um, and the theorems can be it's, it's, it's formal in a very interesting way. Uh, it uh, theorems can be proved about it, and it, you know the theorems usually say that with high probability this is going to work. Okay, I mean, and high pro the, the probability space is the connectome, which is random. Okay, you know, so this is the whole, this is the mathematical spirit spirit of this of this work. Um, and can be simulated efficiently. Okay, so you know we have we have found some uh, very uh, you know a, a very clever way to uh, simulate uh, tens of millions of neurons and trillions of synapses uh, in uh, on a laptop uh, in in an hour. Okay, you know so so that's uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So this is, this is the ultimate goal. Okay, yeah. So uh, and. Uh, it can be implemented large scale cognitive phenomena. Okay, and I'll tell you what, you know. Uh, uh, so let me tell you, it's, we call it NEMO. Uh, it used to be called the assembly calculus, but we found this name a little misleading, and now we call it NEMO for neural model. model okay, so, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, what's a brain? It's a bunch of brain areas, let's say 50 brain areas. Each one has n neurons, maybe 100 million, 10 million. Okay, so usually you have a million neurons. Uh, the synapses are random. Okay, there are the, you know GNP random. We know we know from brain theory that that the brain is not GNP, but uh, uh, we have more faithful models and they behave the same. So we like we like GNP. Okay, because you can prove theorems. Uh, 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 some pairs of areas are connected by synapse fibers. In other words, not only within every area, but between pairs of areas, okay, there, there are also similar random uh, bipartite uh, connections. Um, uh, inhibition. Inhibition is this, okay, so we know that every time something happens, uh, our, our, you know, our brain doesn't want us to have uh, a, an epileptic uh, seizure, okay? So what it does, it says quiet down, and this is, this is done by inhibitory neurons, right? So in every area, at any moment, at, at most k neurons, you know, think of k as 1,000 or 10,000 neurons can fire. Uh, and uh, Hebian plasticity, what you know, that if a neuron fires, and if there is a synapse from this neuron to another neuron, and the next, uh, and sort of, you know, the next uh, moment, uh, the next step, okay, and I'm having in bold face because uh, in this model, unlike the brain, uh, computation takes, time, takes place in steps, okay, you know, in sync. Uh, and again, you have made uh, relaxations and you notice that it behaves the same. It's not, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a distorted assumption. In any way, if this happens, then the weight of this of this synapse increases by five percent, let's say. Okay, so, and that's it. Okay, there is there is okay. There is one other detail, important detail, that individual areas can be inhibited. In other words, non-neuron will fire there at this, the next step, or disinhibited via a simple mechanism that is driven by the other neurons. Okay, 
And this is it, nothing else, okay? This is, this is the whole module of the brain. Uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, by the way, it's Turing complete. In other words, you can do any computation you want uh, in space, square root of the ratio n over k, okay? So, you know, from the, what I told you, this, this is a few dozen, okay? You know, so it can do a few dozen parallel steps. That's a lot of mental computation, okay? That's an incredible lot of mental computation, okay? It's a very powerful computer. All right? Good. Uh, and uh, our masterpiece, uh, until recently, is a parser that we wrote in this, okay? So a parser that really parses English sentences, okay? So I'm going, I'm going to tell you how it works. Um, it's uh, it ha a bunch of brain areas. Uh, this brain area is called the lexicon, okay? And it contains representations, okay? A thousand neurons each in, 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 our, in our simulation of, uh, of uh, words, okay? They are not disjoint, you know, I have, you know but, but they can overlap, but that's fine. Uh, and, the, and there, are other, there are other areas that stand for sort of parts of speech and for syntactic roles, okay? And, uh, and they are connected by fibers. Uh, and this, uh, this uh, is supposed to correspond to what, to the way neurolinguists believe that, that this happens, right? I mean, so, uh, so what happens? I mean, uh, the, the input is a sequence of excitations of word assemblies. In other words, I mean, we could have a, a audio interface, okay? So, you know, but it would be cheating, right? I mean, no, we just, we just, we just uh, excite, you know, the, the correspond, you know, uh, cats chase dogs, okay? Cats, the, the, the representation of cats fires first, then the representation of chase, then the representation of dogs, okay? Um, each word assembly has an action set which dehibit and disinhibit actions on areas and encodes its parts of speech, its syntactic role, okay? So uh, this is sort of, you know, in other words, the lexicon is done in a very, very elaborate way, is put together. Uh, it, and when a word assembly fires, its action set is executed and the sum total of the word action set is, is what we can, we can call the grammar of the language. And, I mean, you know, this is a parser of English, but uh, we also wrote a parser of Russian, and other people have done Japanese, Mandarin, Hungarian, a couple of other languages. Uh, and uh, and uh, so let's say that, uh, that uh, indeed it's cats chase dogs, okay? So what will happen? Cats will fire, and you notice that, that it from, the, from the start, this fiber was, was on, was disinhibited, and the reason is that this is English, okay? And in English, uh, the subject will come first, and therefore you want to connect the lexicon to the subject, okay? So, and when we see the first, uh, the first uh, uh, noun, we uh, surmise that it is, it is the subject, okay? So, the, it will be copied, this, uh, you know, there, there is a very simple operation that, that was the first thing we discovered in this model, that representations are easy to copy. Uh, then uh, uh, we are preparing for the next, uh, you know, uh, that's part of the cat's action set, uh, for the next stage where uh, Chase uh, fires. It is copied over there, and since Chase knows that it is a transitive verb, okay, it also opens this fiber that will, that will connect, that will, ex it will wait for the object, okay? And uh, well, indeed, uh, uh, the object uh, comes and it's, okay, so, uh, it worked fine, but how do, how do we know that it has parsed, okay? You know, that's, that's a legitimate question. That's simple. Uh, uh, after cats change dogs, period, high synaptic weights form a valid dependency tree, which is what NLP folks do. Yes? What do you mean you wrote a parser? Huh? You said we wrote a parser in this. So what you wrote, yes. uh, what do I say wrote the parser, we set up a about, about 80 million neurons, okay, uh, randomly connected, and uh, installed these representations uh, in the lexicon, and nothing else. After that, it works by itself. The neurons do the work. That we have a lexicon, and you, you gave some random neurons. 
so 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 the, the so what we do we we spend some time uh, installing these words okay this lexicon nothing else on on some neurons on uh, yeah you know a thousand neurons each okay we, we pick them at random and we and yeah. we yeah, yeah. And then you, you and, and then and then it it works okay uh, you know thanks for asking this question because it it it, it helps me sort of about the next uh, okay good yes Yes, 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 yes. Uh, it's it's a central limit theorem, man. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. You can't beat it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we have run probably tens of thousands of of, of little experimentalists like that, and 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 it has not. It has never. Has never. We haven't noticed uh, that that the central limit theorem fails. So we'll never make a stupid mistake. It's just a tail event. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. I mean, no, and, and uh, I mean, believe it. Even I make mistakes when I speak once in a while. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. Um, all right. Uh, okay. Um, so that's what I wanted to say, right? I mean, no, that this is implemented exclusively through the spikes of neurons. Okay. In other words. There is no loops, no if then else, okay, nothing, okay. This is not a program, all right. I mean, no, it is it is a hardware architecture, okay, which we knew it's too incomplete, but in this particular case, uh, uh, gives you gives you a parser of English. But why is it not a parser of English and not of German? For uh, you can, you know, if 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 you give me a student in three days, there will be a parser of German. Oh, there is training. And the training is installing the lexicon. Okay? And naming, I'm coming to this, okay? This, yeah, you know, so, so, so I'm, I'm coming to exactly this. Any more questions? Yeah. Maybe it's the same question. At which point do you tell them that subject comes first? Oh, uh, for English? You know, for Mandarin, we don't. You know, so you know, or or for 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 Russian, we don't. Okay, but uh, but for English, we say you know we we wire it in. Okay, that 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 uh, that. Uh, I mean, you know, the only thing we do is that is that uh, the initial state has this red fiber, red. Okay, disinhibited, and and this way it it knows that it's going to be the subject. Okay, yeah. Why do you have to do this for English, but not for Russian? Or uh, because Russian is a, is a different language. It does not have a word order. Okay? French would be the same. Okay? Irish, uh, the verb comes first. Okay? You know, so, so, you know, uh, so you have to have a notion of uh, a syntax to uh, Yes. You, here we wire the syntax. That's what I said, right? I mean, we wire the grammar. The grammar is in the... Yes. I mean, you know, uh, we are now way past that. But I mean, at that point, we just said, suppose we know the grammar and we can wire it in, in a particular brain area. Will the dumb thing be able to parse correctly? Okay, you know, and it does parse correctly. Tal, you have a question? Yes, I have a more high-level question. So it's, it's very interesting. So this is supposed to hopefully model how the brain works after the learning. Stage. After, exactly, exactly. <laughs> this is a mature, this is a mature language organ. This is your language organ. Okay, so you know, I, I. This may, exactly. I mean, yeah, we are talking about Michael. But, yeah. Did you just call him mature? Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. It parses sentences like this, uh, and the speed is about 20-25 sp uh, spikes per word, which is uh, about the speed I'm speaking now, and your and your and your parser is working now. Uh, and also, Ryan, you have space, uh, simple parsers in other language. We published it uh, in Tackle, and uh, you can find the code online. And you can find the code of Nemo online. Okay, you know it's uh, you know and you can play with it. Okay, incidentally, uh, to to play with Nemo, you have uh, the first command is load brain, which is. <laughs> Which is a which is a great thing to type to, to start your day. Okay, <laughs> six a.m. Six a.m. Right. That's yeah. good. Um, so 
here is what they ask us, usually new ribs uh, reviewers, okay, you know, but now we have parsers that can do so much more, okay, so he missed the point. Uh, uh, true, but the point of ours is that it's biologically plausible, implemented exclusively through the spiking of stylized neurons without back probe. It is the first of its kind, that we are, and you see, no, this is important, we see no fundamental limits to how good it can become, okay, so in other words, we have not hit a wall yet, wall yet on this, okay. Uh, uh, how are you going to test your theory on humans? Uh, we will not. It's not a theory. It's a proof of concept. Okay. So you know, before this parser, I was not sure that uh, that parsing in English did not uh, require divine intervention. Okay. Now I, I I'm willing to believe that it does not. Okay. Uh, uh, but how does this complicated? mechanism come about. I think a lot of you ask this, okay? How, how does this come about, right? Okay, uh, but that's a fair question. All right, so, so let's talk about it. Uh, the hard part is filling the blanks, okay? In other words, the hard part is installing these, these uh, 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 how do you call them, these representations in the right place and, and with the right connections and labeling these areas, okay? So this is, you know, and the question is, how is this done? That's my, that's my granddaughter, by the way. Okay, so, um, uh, and the neural, you know, linguists have been talking for 60 years about the neural, you know, Chomsky, you know, and when they repeat Chomsky's uh, phrase, the neural basis of language, uh, Linguists feel the need to, uh, to, for their voice to sound as it comes from a cave, okay? The neural, maybe, you know, so, you know, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's like an irreverent question. You are not, so, you know, what is, and, you know, we can, we can, you know, a stupid experiment can bring you close to amazing questions, right? I mean, what is the neural base of a language? It is this, minus the labels, plus hardware for semantics and generation, okay? In other words, we must find other hardware that gives not just syntax, but what, what the sentence means. And generation, because, because the, the person has to speak, okay, has to, has to generate. And uh, plus the ability to learn all these things, okay? So in other words, we must create an architecture that, that, that will learn all these things. How am I doing with time? Uh, so the short thing is that we have done it, okay? We have, we have a paper now. That is uh, that you can find. Uh, uh, it's uh, biologically plausible language acquisition. Okay, uh, uh, it's something that we wrote with 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 uh, with Dmitropolsky. Uh, uh, Dmitropolsky, by the way, is uh, is the last year PhD student, and and uh, uh, he's going to be on the market uh, this, this fall. Uh, uh, he, uh, so the hardware is uh, a tabula, tabula rasa of a couple of dozen brain areas, uh, fibers, and populations of LRIs. I didn't explain what this is. This is the mechanism by which remote areas can be inhibited and disinhibited. Okay? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, but it's a tabula rasa. There is no wiring except for randomness. No wiring whatsoever. All right? And uh, the input... Uh, is uh, a modest number of grounded shared attention sentences in any natural language, okay? Uh, and it doesn't have to be the same natural language, okay? So, you know, if uh, the two parents speak a different language and, uh, and there is a way for the baby to understand who, who, which language is being spoken by the, by the, by the, by the tutor, uh, you can learn two languages simultaneously. So, you know, multilinguality is captured in our model, okay? And, and we have done experiments with this. So, a modest number, okay? This is what Chomsky calls the poverty of stimulus, okay? That it's one of the, one of the miracles of language that, uh, that uh, you know, we learn to speak having heard only uh, a few tens of thousands of sentences, okay? You know, and, and uh, all right. So, um, uh, so it has to be grounded, okay? So, by the way, we give mathematical, for the first time, I believe, we give a mathematical definition of what modest means, what, what, what the, pro, what the, what the pro, 
poverty of stimulus means, okay? Uh, and I'll, give you, I'll tell you immediately. So uh, these are all, these are all uh, hot button stuff, okay? Uh, grounded, what does grounded mean? It means that it has to happen, in other words, there is a pupil and a tutor, and the pupil and the tutor have shared attention, they look at the same thing, and what is being spoken about is happening, okay? In other words, a cat is chasing a dog. You know, cats are chasing dogs at this moment, okay? So, you know, uh, well, it has to be grounded, okay? Because this is our difference from chat GPT, that, uh, that, that uh, what we know is based on life experiences, okay? You know, so, uh, uh, and shared attention, okay? Uh, as, as explained. Um, uh, and modest means it should not be much bigger than the lexicon, okay? So, you know, in our experiments, this, uh, this is a very small constant. It's like 10, okay? That, that, that does not need to be uh, much bigger than the lexicon. Uh, the output is a mature language organ complete with a lexicon, a comprehender, and a generator. In other words, uh, 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 what, I, what, I, what, I, what I've told you, in, but I will not have time to, um, uh, uh, to tell you much more. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so you can find uh, in uh, in uh, uh, the archive uh, this uh, this uh, this paper, the textual biologically plausible language organ. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, uh, let me tell you something else, though. Let's go back to the parser, okay? Uh, the parser says uh, cats chase dogs, pa parsers, parsers. Dogs run away, parsers, parsers. Cats get bored, parsers, parsers. Uh, but then, look at the second one. Cats, when they're fearless, chase dogs. Uh, the parser cannot do that. You see why? There is center embedding. You understand what I mean, center embedding? That, that, that uh, there is a sentence planted in the middle of another sentence. Okay? This is recursion. This is, uh, you know, Chomsky believes that this is the basis, is the, this is sort of, you know, the essence, the quintessence of language. Okay? That basically it is our recursive, uh, our, our, our ability for recursion that differentiates us from behaviors of other animals. Okay? Uh, and uh, and uh, so, how do you do this? Okay. All right. I mean, so and and yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Usually, and 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 linguists they believe that there are tribes in the Amazon that do that. Okay. You know, sort of. Uh, 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 I broke a chair, my father had given me the chair, uh, my father, and so on, had come for, you know, for a visit, and so on. I mean, so that's, that's uh, 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 you know, they, they, would, they would talk like that. I mean, and there, is, there was some evidence at some point, and then it was, it was contradicted that, that there, are, there are languages without recursion, okay? Uh, but uh, but um, uh, the point is that, uh, that uh, uh, first of all, okay, other linguists say that recursion exists, but it's not infinite recursion. I mean, if, if you embed more than twice, uh, the, your, your interlocutor walk, walks away, okay, you know, so, uh, uh, you see what I'm saying, I mean, you know, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, the point is recursion happens, okay, and if, if we want to give an account of language, a neural account of language, we have to see, to show you how to implement recursion, right? Uh, so, how do you implement recursion, all right, I mean, so let's, this is, uh, uh, and, you know, so how, how, what do you do here? Uh, the idea is you parse on and return. So, so I mean, you know, watch how, how, how we are proposing that it's done, and I believe it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it's uh, you know, I like this idea. It's simple enough that it could be the, right, the, the thing that just happens in the brain. Uh, you say cats, uh, you see, you know, that's the beginning of a sentence. Uh, you see a comma, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, oral speech that could be intonation or, or, or you know, so, so some kind of pause, and, and, you know, uh, of telling pause. Uh, 
and you say, oh, oh, that we have a bending, okay? Before you see a fine end of sentence uh, thing, you say you see a new sentence, okay? You are going to see a second verb. What are you going to do, okay? So uh, here's what you do. Uh, you parse the second sentence, and you forget, and you, forget, you essentially forget what you, have, what you have seen before, okay? You parse the second sentence. But you have, you know, instead of ka, you know, there could be seven words up to cats, okay? But so you have a working memory where you keep it, okay? And, and, and Nemo is very good at remembering a few, a few things, okay? You know, uh, remembering sequences, okay? Uh, so you remember the thing, and then if you see that there is an embedding, uh, what you do, you say, okay, there is an embedding. Let's parse the second sentence, okay? You parse this, okay? You see the second comma, and now what do you do? You jump back to the beginning of the first sentence, you parse it, start parsing it, and then you say, oh, I have seen this, I don't need it, okay? You, go, you jump to chase, and you finish parsing. Is this clear? So that's, uh, and then there is, there, is a, there is a way to do it uh, in Nemo, okay? So, you know, and, and we have implemented it. So, you know, we, we, two undergraduates here at Columbia and, 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 and Dan and I wrote a postscriptum to that paper where we say, by the way, we can, we can, do, we can do recursion, okay? But, you know, but here comes... Sorry? Yes. With code, you have to do with random Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is the bane of my life, man, yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, so, so far, the parser was a finite state machine, okay? Uh, and uh, the state is the set of this, the red, set of red fibers, that's the state, okay? The state of the, uh -huh. uh, So here is a, here is a, here is a slight generalization of a finite state machine. A fallback automaton. At any point, it can return to the most recent marked symbol. In other words, you mark the symbol. What do you mean? You mark the beginning of every sentence. Okay? When you see, when you see the, when you, uh, when you parse the embedded sentence, okay, and there could be another embedding in the embedded sentence and so on at item. When you see the embedded sentence and when you finish parsing it, you see the second comma, you jump to the beginning of, to the most recent marked symbol, you unmark it, okay? You start parsing, you omit the parsed part, uh, and then you continue, you finish your parsing, okay? So that's, that's, uh, this is, this is what uh, unmark it, then skip the other editing part and continue parsing. So this is like a final automaton, except it has two things. It can remember when it has seen something, and it can jump back to things that it has marked, okay? All right, so we call it, we call it fallback automaton. It means a sort of a deep go on visibly push down language. Reasonably? Visibly push down language. I see, okay, okay. Uh, uh, who's? Rajiv Alou. Rajiv. Yeah, okay, okay, so we'll talk about it. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay? All right. Uh, here's the theorem. Uh, fallback automata is precisely context-free languages. Okay? In other words, okay, this, to me, this is, uh, uh, this is, uh, this is, you know, I, I almost, I almost, you know, I felt very moved when, 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 when we realized that. Okay? Here is why. Because in the 1950s, Chomsky, uh, uh, was uh, interested in language, okay? So, in, and for this, he introduced, he defined context-free grammars, okay? You know, they didn't exist, phrase structure grammars, he defined them, all right? And, uh, and the, the, ne the next 60 years, he has been criticized from all sides about this, okay? That it's, it's uh, you know, they're not enough, there are context-sensitive uh, constructs in language, natural language, it's too much because, because there, is no real, uh, re there is no real recursion uh, uh, in, in language and so on, okay? And so, 70 years later, uh, uh, computer scientists were trying to uh, uh, see how recursion can be implemented in language. And sort of, you know, without planning it, sort of, you know, I know this, uh, they stumbled upon the same concept, okay, exactly the same concept. So, I mean, I, th I, thought, I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, by the way, 
many of you may think, yeah, I can see why this is a push-down automaton. It's, it's a very hard theorem, okay? It's, uh, it's such a hard theorem that the list of authors has a why. Do you notice? Okay? Uh, uh, we had to recruit Michalis, okay, you know, so uh, after a while, okay, and, and, and then our problems went away, right? Huh? Uh, there, there are no, there is no easy and difficult, there, there, there is no easy direction, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, by the way, uh, <laughs> uh, You notice, can you tell which one is mine, which is one is Michalis's, okay? You know, uh, our, uh, you know our, our doors are five yards away. Uh, I have a sticker behind my door that, you know, that's, uh, that reads, uh, if I don't answer, knock behind you, okay? You know? <laughs> so, um, all right. So, thank you. Uh, Uh, by the way, so you know, I, 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 it's, I can't put to, you know, I'm good at putting things to words, but I really can't, can't, can't express how much I admire and how much I love this man. Okay, you know, so, uh, you know, he has been a companion, a brother, a, a collaborator. Uh, uh, he's, uh, he's the kindest and smartest person I know. Uh, at this, uh, you know, so, uh, and, and uh, uh, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful to you uh, that, that you came to uh, wish him a happy birthday, okay? Have, happy birthday. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned that was a whole generation. Yeah. Generation means that, that, you see, that you see a cat chasing a, a dog, and you say the cat chases a dog. But can you do, can you respond to prompts? I'm thinking, but can you do, can you respond to answer questions? Yes, you can, you definitely can. Uh, and then you are, and so, you know, this is, this is, we are working on this, you know, so, I mean, uh, we are, we do have done the hard part, okay, sort of, you know, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, uh, uh, I mean, uh, for this project, uh, what I can't wait for is the first uh, real obstacles we're going to find. We're going to find obstacles. I mean, our language is infinite. The language is incredibly subtle. And, and we're going to find obstacles, you know, and then that will be, you know, what, what else, what other mechanisms language uses, okay? So, you know, there is a, there is a, there is a, there is a you know, uh, there is a theory of intelligence that says that there are, two complementary systems, they're called the complementary learning systems. There are the three systems that you learn, the few short learning, so you, know, you, you learn a few basic things. And then there are the systems that, uh, that, uh, the system that, uh, uh, that watches what's happening, uh, st uh, sort of notices statistical irregularities, and learns them, okay, you know, so, and, and, and so, you know, I, we already use this. But but uh, but I, I believe that many subtleties of language will de will depend on on this latter part. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, listen. Okay. Uh, good question. Uh, first of all, there are always commas. Okay, so you know, there, there, you know, in other words, when when I embed a sentence, uh, you know, and people have studied this. Okay, that that that, that I signal. You know, you may not listen to the signal. So what happens if you don't listen to the signal? Nothing. Sort of, you know, you 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 at some point you will say, wait a minute, this sentence does not make sense, and you will backtrack. Okay, so you know, I have not modeled that. I know you can. So you know, just to have two hands. Yeah. 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 Thank you. First of all, do not expect that I will say something more important than a legend to a legend, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the only thing that I would like to say is the following. Um, you know, Michalis is so young, and even today that we're speaking, he has students. 
Uh, all these th three days, uh, we were amazed about the research that uh, he has done all these years. But uh, there are also other people that they would like to thank him. And uh, I refer to his current students, but you will discover that they are a lot. So, uh, and what each of them, they would like to say something about him. Now, a small issue is that if you are so modest and humble, the people that typically you will attract, they are also humble and modest. So uh, initially we decided to make a video, then we discuss and they say, we are very humble, we, don't, we are very shy, <laughs> we cannot do it. Uh, so we decided to write some text, so... Uh, and <laughs> yeah, I don't know how I am his student. <laughs> so here is the first one, here are the testaments. Rasida starts, Michalis has been a wonderful advisor to me over the past year. He's of course brilliant and has an incredible intuition when it comes to research problems, but my favorite thing about Michalis is his kindness and perpetual calm, unflappable the manner. He is remarkably patient, willing to explain things repeatedly and in different ways until I can fully understand them. His optimism and quiet belief that things will all work out at the end are something. I, I hope to absorb myself as I continue to work with him during my PhD. Miranda says, no, no, you can clap in the middle, uh, don't stop. <laughs> There are many qualities I admire about Michalis. His kindness, patience, and selflessness. Uh, one uh, I have especially appreciated as his student is his ability to find wonder in every problem. In my first years, I brought Michalis problems and I asked if they were interesting. He never said no. To him, every problem is interesting. Maybe some just more than others, but... And when... I bring him ideas, he gives me tirelessly his full attention. This support has been invaluable in my first years and I have gained so much confidence sharing my ideas because of him. Oliver, I hope that I kept the text as it is, okay? So Oliver describes, Michalis has been a source of wisdom and inspiration during my time as his student. I have often found that when I bring to him some half-baked idea, he will quickly find the most essential part of it. In some cases, before I am halfway through explaining the idea and uh, guide me towards the, as, uh, the aspect of the problem. It is remarkable to me that even when it comes to a new problem which he has yet to think much about it, he still has such a keen eye for the right path. And not only that, his guidance is always given in the form, what about this? Rather than, you must do that, which to me is invaluable. When I leave a meeting, having absorbed his ideas, his questions, my subconscious feeling is always that I have been affirmed by, in my own path, rather than, rather than rerouted or uh, redirected by some external force. Though, of course, rerouting has occurred. This advising style inspires a lot of self-confidence in a student, and I am very grateful to Michalis for this. Sivam adds, in addition to what everyone else has said, Michalis took me on, uh, as a confused first-year student, helped me take uh, my initial steps in research and has continued to support me ever since. It takes a truly exceptional advisor to trust and provide support for a student despite uh, shifting research interests. I will forever be grateful for all the advice, encouragement, generosity, and wisdom he has generously shared with me over the course of graduate school. Yuhao narrates, Michalis has numerous qualities that uh, we, his students, deeply admire. Let me recall an instance that I will never forget. Once, while preparing a submission, I was convinced that the lemma in my proof was correct. I had even formally proved it. Uh, however, hidden within the proof was a subtle error. In our meeting, Michalis quickly spotted the sentence that where the error was. That night, he sent me a counterexample that showed my lemma was wrong, and he kindly suggested a clearer alternative solution, and finally we proved a stronger result. This is our advisor, Michalis Yanakakis. 
closing, paraphrasing a discussion that I have with Dimitris, Michalis is like a fixed point, like a contraction. This is my addition. Wherever you will start, whenever you will meet him, you will discover the same modest, humble, beautiful mind. So I will close with the following. Michalis is from Crete. So in Crete, in such kind of celebration, typically we offer to the, honor, to the honored person a knife that has called some uh, poem, some Cretan poem. First of all, if I bring a knife, I will be arrested in, uh, in the borders, and I don't want to have that again. So... <laughs> <laughs> Closing this fest. Uh, typically, I'm doing it in Greek, so... Uh, be fair, this is my first trial to have it so long. We gather today in August summer warmth and there to honor a mind that is beyond compare. Michali, happy birthday. Your wisdom is our guide. While reading a proof of your theorems, we always feel such pride. In webs of complex open problems, vast and deep, where CS theories riddles often make us weep, Michalis stands as a beacon strong and bright, turning tangled questions into clear insight. Calm as the sea, when dawn kisses Cretan shore, Michalis behavior so modest at its core. No boost, no fanfare, yet his work resounds. In every proof, his quiet strength is found. In rooms where minds converge and theories blend, Michalis has stood both mentor and true friend. A mentor shaping minds like a clay to art, Michalis has nurtured every student's eager's heart. For Michalis today, boundless is our esteem. We celebrate loudly the architect of our dreams. So stand, dear friends, and let your claps resound for a mentor, for a scholar, for a friend we have found. Tonight we rise to celebrate his role, not just in saving our minds, but mainly our souls. Thank you, Michal. I'm totally floored. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very humble, very grateful. Um, first of all, but congratulations on the poem. <laughs> By the way, that. Well, I, know, I knew you had talent. I didn't know how much talent in, in poetry. So uh, this has been uh, actually a very uh, fantastic occasion for me. I mean, it's very, I'm really moved by the attention, by the, you know, all the nice things you said, and also just by organizing this, just by coming, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, all of you came here to, um, you know, to uh, present, and um, I'm, I'm really grateful. Uh, I, you know, following on the uh, what the students said. I mean, uh, I mean, there have been uh, people that, uh, you know, several people that have been very important in my growing up, in my life, and. Uh, I've, you know, I've tried to emulate them and uh, hope, you know, I'm trying to, you know, transmit some of what I have learned and, the, uh, you know, the examples they have said. And so I'll, uh, I'll just uh, want to, you know, thank some of them, say, say some of them. So I'll talk a little bit. Uh, uh, I haven't prepared slides or anything. I, I'll just uh, uh, improvise as I'm, I'm talking. Um, well, I went to, as an undergraduate, I went to the same school as Christos, to the National um, Technical University of Athens. And uh, I, at the time, I mean, I was not um, really thinking about research or anything like that. I mean, I was good at math and good at these things, but, uh, you know, things, uh, there were uh, more important things in life. I mean, there was, uh, you know, the political situation in Greece, so, you know, you know, we spent a lot of time on that. Of course, we were young, there were other things to do besides studying, so that's, uh, uh, there is, uh, it was a good time. Plus, the, you know, the, there were some, you know, professors were putting a lot of effort, but there were a lot of students, and it's really, takes something to get, you know, you know, you know 
inspiring, you know, active professors. So uh, the, the first big uh, influence on me was a professor who had just come from uh, uh, the United States at the time. Actually, there is lots of the, you know, throughout the life, some, uh, you know, there's a lot of connections to Columbia, Princeton, Bell Labs. So the, you know, the um, uh, reason I was interested in communication theory, that Christo said, is that there was this uh, professor who had just come from, he was a professor at Columbia. Originally, he was a PhD student at Columbia, went to work a few times, a few years at Bell Labs, came back to teach at Columbia, and they came back to, to, to Greece to teach. His name was Emmanuel Protonotarius. So he was teaching communication theory, stochastic processes, information theory. So it, it was a kind of breath of, you know, it was uh, inspiring, you know, that's very exciting. At the time, actually, uh, we have the bad habits in, uh, in Greece at the time, not to go too much into classes, but, you know, that's one class I went uh, every time. So then I thought, oh, okay, I want to do that. I want to, you know, that's something I can do after school. I had also worked in a summer at a factory, and I had seen what people do every day in factories. You know, I was studying mechanical and electrical engineering, so the alternative to go to work, you know, in industry, and that didn't seem so exciting. So I thought I'll go to, to do research in communication theory. I was accepted at uh, Princeton, so, you know, the, I said, okay, I went to Princeton, so the first day I went there, and they, I was assigned, I went to study communication information theory, but they, there was also a Greek professor there by the name of Theo Pavlidis. So they assigned me also, they, I had an advisor in communication theory, but they assigned me also uh, the, him as advisor since I was Greek. So he told me, you know, electrical engineering, communication theory is good, but there is this thing, computer science. Uh, and now, computer science, we had not studied, any, uh, we had very little in Greece. I mean, I, we had learned how to program in Fortran and learned the rudiments of computers, but uh, this all seemed very boring, you know. It was the times, you know, where, you know, you couldn't just program interactively, you had to write a program, went a few days, you were, uh, you were, give your punched cards, wait a few days, get back the results, correct it, and so So that didn't seem like uh, anything else. But uh, so he told me to take some computer science classes. So take, so say take algorithms and take automata theory. So Jeff Fullman was teaching automata theory. That was totally new to me. And uh, this seems really beautiful stuff. So that was really, um, it's, you know, I found it so different. I mean, I like differential equations and the stochastic processes and everything, continuous math, but that was something else. There was also Christos there, like he said. So Christos was talking to me about the traveling salesman problem and about, uh, you know, graph coloring and about this, these uh, puzzles, which to me seemed like, Come on, you get a PhD for this stuff. I mean, this is, you know, recreational mathematics. That's, you know, you can, you know, you play with kids, okay? You can uh, give that as puzzles to pass your time. Uh, so you can actually get a PhD for that, get a job for that. So that seemed like a lot of fun also. So, <laughs> so after the first year, uh, I decided I'm going to switch to computer science. So, so I went to Jeff and said, uh, you know, I really like automata theory. I want to do automata theory. So Jeff told me, automata theory is dead. <laughs> <laughs> Which maybe at the time was dead, right? But then uh, let it, <laughs> it, was it was on life support, right, yeah. Uh, but then maybe 10 years or so later, Moshe, primarily, and others kind of resurrected it. And uh, automata theory came back to life, but that's another story, so that's a later story. So I got to later get involved in that. But uh, so I said, okay, automata theory is no good. 
So, uh, um, Jeff suggested, uh, you know, there is this empirical completeness, but now we know how to do empirical completeness. How about approximations? So that's, I got into approximations and I started working on that. Uh, I didn't get very far. I mean, I ran into, you know, the basic problems like that must do mention this morning, you know, like graph coloring, click and so forth. Uh, I proved a bunch of theorems of empirical completeness, and then uh, Jeff told me one day, you have done enough. I went to Columbia to give a talk today. I had given him, um, a, I don't know if you remember it, I had given you like a write-up of some results, you know, a one-page abstract of the result. And uh, he said, that seems good enough for me to graduate. So I told them that you are finishing this year. I said, what do you mean I'm finishing? I just... I just started. <laughs> I, uh, you know, let me stay one more year to prove the click at least is not approximable. <laughs> <laughs> so Jeff said, uh, it's okay, you can graduate, you go work, and you'll prove it next year. <laughs> so of course, as you, I mean, most of you know that as of Madhu, that took another 15 years or 13 years to solve, which was actually a good, good advice from Jeff to, <laughs> to do that. Um, so that, that was really great. And uh, so, uh, um, now, as Christo said, while he was there, actually we were talking every day. And I mean, I was getting exposed to, to all of that. And uh, you know, it's, um, you know, that's, kind of rewires the brain in some ways. So I think we probably exchanged some quantum bits there. We've got some quantum entangling because afterwards, you know, I would call him on the phone. He would say like a few words. I knew exactly what he was saying. I would say a few words. He knew exactly what I was thinking. So, so the amount of communication was below the information content. So there, there must have been some, uh, some uh, you know, shared bits that still are there and we continue to share. Uh, so then uh, I went to Bell Labs, so the, you know, and where um, Alejo hired me. And, you know, the, of course, Jeff is a Columbia was a Columbia undergraduate, uh, um, PhD from Princeton, worked to, at Bell Labs for some years and then went back to, to Princeton. Alejo went to Bell Labs, graduated from Princeton, went to Bell Labs and stayed at Bell Labs. So, so it was kind of a small family circle I was moving into. And, um, so Al, uh, Al hired me and uh, that was a... Um, Actually, that was a fantastic place, you know, a fantastic uh, move to go there. I thought initially I would go to Bell Labs, stay for a year or two, and then go to a university. But uh, it was such a great place, you know, with, um, you know, the, the people that were there and the atmosphere that I stayed and stayed and stayed and year passed and, uh, you know, Every so often I would say, okay, maybe it's time to go to university. Let's give it a few more years. And that went on until um, over 20 years, 2000 some. Uh, but I, you know, it was, first of all, it's, I mean, the, the labs at the time, the, the labs, the, 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 I mean, there are research labs today, good research labs like Google and uh, Microsoft and other places, but I think uh, Bell Labs was a unique place. And uh, because of the people that were there, the management, you know, so Al was my manager for many years, you know, was kind of enlightened and would let you do what you wanted guide you very gently, give you the right directions, but not, you know, be very forceful. And there was so much collegiality among everybody, among all the, all the people. And then after, um, after all, uh, Ravi Sethi was my manager. So Ravi was 
Jeff's student from Princeton, so that's, again, as I said, small family circle moving around. And they kind of set an example for me also how a, a mentor should behave or a manager should behave. So I became department head and, you know, I tried to emulate that with them. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I was uh, lucky to have lots of great people that came, you know, some had to come, like uh, Rajiv Valur that uh, was here and uh, Chandra was here, Lisa, Lisa Zang. Uh, lots of great uh, John of Aguimaum talked in the morning and uh, lots of other great people. Plus colleagues that were not in my department like Bob Tarjan that uh, talked a few days ago and uh, David Johnson who was actually a great friend for many years. You know, we were so kind of my best friend in, um, in uh, Bell Labs. He had, uh, I mean, I had a department in uh, computer science. He had a department in uh, mathematical sciences doing also theory. So we had two full departments of essentially theory people. And, uh, you know, doing uh, great work. And David and I, you know, had a, you know, you, we were just very close. And, uh, you know, that's, um, unfortunately, he left too early. But, uh, you know, that was great. Um, Great colleague and a great place. So that's uh, so as I'm, uh, you know, some people said that I was not too bossy with the people in my department. It didn't uh, drive them uh, too hard, you know. Uh, uh, some of them would work on their own too very hard, like Usha. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, everybody worked very hard. But I mean, it uh, was. Uh, um, great to be, but it's, I think we all take ex uh, examples of uh, our role models. So when, when I moved to academia, again, I try to, um, you know, I'm, I was really moved with the nice words of the students. I'm, you know, I hope I'm uh, being with my students as good as my professors had been with me. And, uh, you know, they uh, follow on the, you know, the get to, you know, do their, uh, you know, I don't try to make sure that they, everybody, I want to see everybody blossom and everybody does, you know, it's, uh, you know, Manolis and Dimitris and Elias and, uh, you know, everybody is, um, I'm really happy to see uh, how everybody is doing uh, because in many, many ways, uh, um, you know, I mean, it's, these are, it's like the academic children is our, like our children and uh, the point of being in a uh, university. I mean, Belabs was a great place for having all the great colleagues. You get students in the summer briefly as uh, interns and you see them then go back, you know, and uh, blossom, but you only get them for a short time. So here you get them for a longer time, plus you are in an everyday interaction with them. And that, uh, to me, the big part of being in the university is all this enthusiasm you see from the students, both the PhD students, but also the undergraduates. You know, you go and teach, like the automata theory class, which I teach from time to time, or algorithms. And uh, you see that uh, for many of them, that's new and exciting. And hopefully, you know, some of them get motivated to go work on that. So that keeps us, uh, you know, that keeps me, you know, interested and, you know, young and uh, hopefully, you know, still alert, you know, so that I can answer to all the, uh, you know, hard questions that the students ask. So uh, I, it's been, a, I'm very lucky, it's been a great ride for me, for all, uh, all the people I met, you know, starting with, you know, Christos mentioned, you know, we're like brothers to each other. That's great. You know, my uh, professor, you know, Jeff Je Fullman over there. And my children, my students, my academic children, you know, this, this has been a really satisfying, uh, you know, uh, path for me so far. And I hope I can keep it up for a little while longer. So I'm really thrilled that, you know, and uh, very grateful for everybody that came. I'm, uh, you know, it's... Uh, I, you know, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate, you know, all the, all the um, nice things you said and the, just the fact that you, you have come here. And, um, so thank you.
So thank you all very much.